Give everybody the uh, the five second warning. We're just gonna get going here. We're talking about important stuff here. Yeah, try. Knew it. Full full slate here. She totally knew it. <laughs> Good evening and welcome to the March 12, 2018 meeting of the Town of Scarborough Planning Board. Would you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, roll call, please. Mr. Dupuri? Here. Ms. Hendrickson? Here. Ms. Saunders? Here. Mr. Fellows? Here. Mr. McGee? Here. Mr. Bealey? And Ms. Oglis? Here. Thank you. So in the absence of Mr. Bealey, um, that would make Ms. Hendrickson a voting member this evening. Um, another housekeeping note, uh, as you, if you've seen the agenda, you know we've got a full slate ahead of us this evening. Um, a couple of those items are probably going to involve a fair amount of discussion, possibly some public comment. Um, so. Our policy is that we will not take up a new item after 10.30, so if there's anyone out there now or listening who uh, uh, has an item later on the agenda, you want to try to keep an eye on the, on the time. We'll do our best to work through these as efficiently as possible, but we want to make sure we're thorough as well, of course. Uh, we may take a brief break at some point, too, just given the nature of the, uh, the agenda here. Uh, so on that note, um, we do not have minutes uh, prepared from the last meeting yet. I don't know if we need a formal motion to table that. Basically move that to the next meeting. We'll move that to the next meeting. Yeah. We should have minutes from the uh, board's workshop of the other week as well by that Great. time. So <laughs> Great. Thank you. That's a good reading. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so moving right along then. Our first uh, action item, number four on the agenda, William Weeks requests an advisory opinion for a miscellaneous appeal for an expansion of 565 U.S. Route 1 Assessor's map U35, lot 15. Would staff like to introduce this? Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As you just noted, this is an advisory opinion to the Board of Appeals. Um, essentially, what we have is an existing single family structure in the TVC3 district uh, that is on a property that has uh, route, run, route one frontage. Uh, the use is uh, not permitted in the TBC3 when, it, when the property has uh, frontage along Route 1. However, the property is uh, considered a grandfathered non conforming use, um, so it's legally non conforming. Um, so typically, uh, you know, a, a basic tenet of the zoning ordinance is the eventual elimination of non conformities. However, the ordinance does provide. Um, sort of an avenue, if you will, for a continuance or, um, in this case, a resumption and enlargement of non-conforming conformities through the Zoning Board of Appeals review process. Um, that process is spelled out under Section 5C of the Zoning Ordinance as a miscellaneous appeal. Um, and as part of that process, this board is to provide an advisory opinion to the Zoning Board of Appeals, as they are the ones who will ultimately find the vote. In making your advisory opinion, the board is really asked to reflect on, on two different sections of the ordinance. One is section 3F, um, which essentially uh, reflects on the uh, sort of the neighborhood impacts, if you will, of the um, enlargement or the conversion resumption of one nonconformity to another nonconformity, or in this case, the replacement of, of this structure. Um, that it will not be substantially different from or greater than the impacts <coughs> and effects of the non-conforming use before the proposed enlargement. The other section gets a little more into the specific details of the use. This is section uh, 4I4 of the zoning ordinance, which really talks about impacts in terms of uh, sewage disposal, vehicular pedestrian traffic, public safety concerns, stormwater, noise, hours of operation, and the like. Um, again, here we're talking about a conversion of a single-family home um, or the replacement of an existing single-family home, tear down and rebuilt. Um, so with that, Mr. Chair, uh, turn it back to you. All right. Thanks, Jay. And I'll turn it over to the applicant's representative. Thank you very much. My name is Bill Weeks, and uh, I'm the owner of 565 U.S. Route 1. 
and I am presenting uh, an, an appeal to the both planning board first for the advisory team and then to the zoning board of appeals for the uh, physical uh, miscellaneous appeal and then I'll be seeking a variance appeal after uh, such a miscellaneous appeal uh, presumably gets approved. Uh, so this evening I'm going to uh, address <coughs> all of the items orally as I presented to you in your, uh, your package. The green package of uh, green cover, page M1, states the miscellaneous appeal. M2 is your uh, Town of Scarborough application for miscellaneous appeal, as uh, my responses are all in the uh, following pages. Would you mind just uh, bending the microphone down a little bit there? There you go. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> so M2 and M3 are your uh, applications to the Town of Scarborough. M4, uh, the miscellaneous four, is my right title and interest in the property, the warranty deed, as is M5, the second page. This, this property was purchased uh, in July of 17. Uh, since that period of time, uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, improvements already made to the property in such cleaning out a lot of... Uh, old structures that were abandoning on the property, old pools, uh, automobiles and parts thereof. Uh, it's been quite a process cleaning it up and just getting it uh, neutral to be able to uh, sit and pause as I make my presentation to the town and then to the uh, code enforcement officer for all the permits and approvals. So the property was originally improved in 1950. So that's before 1959, which the town of Scarborough's first zoning ordinance was invented. <coughs> Therefore, it was improved before um, Scarborough had any rules and regulations. So there was no consideration at that time for a side setback, and there was no consideration at that time for the use. However, at that time, that was a residential neighborhood in 1950 when it, was, when it began to be improved. Um, the Scarborough zoning ordinance, which is now in effect, uh, of uh, 1117 PBC 3 presently does interpret it as Jay suggest, said uh, as a present legal non-conforming use um, and I am intending to uh, ask the both boards the planning boards and zoning boards permission to uh, before the fact ask permission to erase the existing structure and pause the existing use resume, enlarge, extend, or expand, as your miscellaneous appeal states, uh, the, the use as a non-conforming residential use in a pre-existing residential neighborhood. Um, and then the variance is, is another step. So in order for me to satisfy uh, your points, I need to address section three. And uh, that begins on M6. And then my answers are on M7. So the impacts and effects, the enlargement, extension, expansion, resumption, or conversion uh, needs to be not worse than, than what it existed before. And in fact, the past use of this property was residential. The proposed resumption is a future single family residential. Oddly enough, if we look at the uh, Scarborough zoning ordinance, uh, multifamily is allowed in the TVC3, however, must be served with public sewer. There's a bit of property right there, uh, uh, right amongst that 565, that is not serviced by public sewer. They're um, very narrow lots, they're very old lots, and they're a bit away uh, in elevation from the available sewer. So uh, at the highest point, if I was to uh, catalog the footprint uh, based on the tax assessor's uh, records, the highest footprint was about 2,800 square feet of occupied space on that property at its all-time gross. My present, uh, present proposal has even been adjusted, downgraded a little bit from your package that I provided you. Uh, I've been able to focus my plans uh, with a little bit more clarity in that I'm not proposing a basement now. So right now my proposal is 1,488 square feet. The old gross is about 2808 at its all-time high. So I'm actually proposing a 50% reduction in the resumption from the property's all-time high. Uh, technically, that would be a 24% increase 
of the footprint, the existing footprint as it sits there on the property today. But from the little tiny house that's on there, 24% increases about 208 square feet. Uh, is 24% increase, so it's all relevant to the to the beginning. So the enlargement, extension, expansion, resumption, uh, and conversion from one non-conforming use to another, all I'm merely doing is technically resuming so that we don't have to prove whether or not the place has been occupied for any longer, unoccupied that is, for any longer than 12 months. We're just going with a total miscellaneous appeal. Resuming the use and uh, enlarging it by that 200 square feet. So now I must satisfy the standards for special exceptions. Uh, the proposed use will not create any unsanitary and helpful condition by reason of uh, sewage disposal, um, air and water quality aspects in respects or aspects to design or operation. Again, this is a reuse of a single family two bedroom home, same number of bedrooms before, same number of bedrooms I'm proposing after. Uh, I am anticipating using the same subsurface wastewater disposal field. However, uh, in order to get an active uh, permit to renovate, I will probably need to prove to the code enforcement office that the existing system is adequate or a replacement system can be installed in its existing location. And that I will be able to do. The proposed use will not create any unsafe vehicular or pedestrian traffic. Uh, with existing uh, or unforeseeable traffic in the vicinity. Well, again, <coughs> uh, as I earlier stated, I have done some improvements. Uh, I've cleared the, sign of the uh, uh, line of sight distances in, in the driveway. I've worked with uh, uh, Public Works in getting the front ditch uh, cleaned up so that the drainage works better and the line of sight is, much, is probably improved twofold <coughs> from what it was before. So, in fact, we've already made improvements that uh, are within the uh, normal maintenance of the, uh, the, land, the, the property owner's abilities. The proposed use will not create any, uh, any additional public safety problems. Uh, in respect to this proposal, uh, actually, if we remove the house and put a new home back up, it will have to conform 100 percent to all the building codes, all the plumbing codes, all the electrical codes. So, in fact, uh, it'll be substantially improved from what it is, uh, as opposed to renovating, and I'll get into that a little bit in a little bit. Uh, the proposed use uh, will not result in any sedimentation or erosion, uh, again, in, in uh, using the best management practices with public works, reditching out front has actually improved the drainage of the two or three upper properties. And uh, we went a property below this downgrade and cleaned up in front of that, too, with the public works crews. They did an amazing job, very timely, very proficient, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a great improvement for the neighborhood. Um, and then the proposed use will be compatible with existing uses in the neighborhood with respect to physical size, visual impact, <coughs> intensity of use, and proximity. Again, we're, we're uh, proposing here to put a residential home back in the pre residential neighborhood. Um, if this was serviced by public sewer, it would be allowed, but it's, it, it, it is on Route 1, and um, it's a single family, not a multifamily. So that, <coughs> that causes it to be a non use. <coughs> so compatibility really is seamless here. Um, there's no, there's no I'm, I'm not asking for uh, something that doesn't or didn't pre-exist. So technically right now, our zoning doesn't fit one-to-one -one because of the, the, the grand master plan of, of TVC3 uh, would prefer multiplexes. But you need a lot of land for multiplex. You need a lot of circulation for parking and for drives and, and whatnot. So as, as your, uh, your package shows you on M10, is the uh, required survey that I will need to get to the Zoning Board of Appeals. So you, you folks also have a, a copy of that. M10 is the existing structure. You see the long, narrow strip uh, in the middle? Uh, that's the building envelope. And you can see how the existing home hangs out both sides, left and right, of the 15-foot setbacks. It does, it does uh, well, clearly exceed the, per, the present front yard and rear yard setbacks. So we'll get into, we'll come back to that in just a minute. And now on 
M8F, the property is located in Shoreland Zoning. So I believe, uh, according to the, the staff uh, notes and discussion, uh, DEP has already been pre-notified. And as we make the presentation to the uh, code officer for plans, uh, it, that may be subject to some additional permits and or permit by rules with DEP uh, in order to disturb the, um, the land there uh, because it's within 250 feet of the upland edge of a wetland. Uh, that, that M10, you can see that 75 foot radius mark, that gets you out of the 75 foot setback. Uh, but it's, we still uh, qualified for uh, shoreland zoning because we're within 250 feet. <coughs> the property to the rear is actually uh, town property. Um, G, and the final uh, condition approval, G, the right title or interest. Again, at the front of the application, you saw my uh, warranty deed for right title or interest. And then the applicant has uh, H, the applicant has a technical financial ability to comply with all the standards. Uh, in fact, I do. I, I presently uh, own the property free and clear without a mortgage. Um, I've been a contractor in town of Scarborough for about 43 years, and uh, I, I definitely can uh, self-finance the improvements, so I don't have to have a third party involved. Uh, any uh, conditions of approval this board or the zoning board may uh, impose on me, I'll be able to satisfy without having to get a third party no, I can. We can make it happen. Um, and then finally, this, uh, this is a, a very, I, I present it as a very seamless, uh, straightforward uh, appeal to the planning board for an advisory opinion to the uh, zoning board for miscellaneous appeal. Um, in any zoning ordinance, you need to hang your hat on something, and the appeals process is what works for some of these very, very narrow lots uh, that have fallen out into non conformity. There's your M10. Uh, the yellow is the existing uh, footprint. Uh, the entire uh, residence has a basement underneath it. My proposal will not. It has decks on the rear and decks on the, on the front uh, and a bulkhead. All of those uh, get exchanged for. There is the, uh, the the pink is my privilege for outside drip edge footprint proposal. 24 by 62 would encompass the whole um, home and garage slab on grade. And in response to the planning staff's uh, proposed uh, suggestion or potential requirement for a hem head turnaround so the vehicles don't have to back up on the front, absolutely. That is the proposed pavement to access the front of the garage be able to back around on the property and then drive back out on Route 1. So I, I think that's you know, <coughs> an absolute must uh, any time of day, especially any time from 4 o'clock on, but any time of day, you don't want to back out on Route 1. Uh, that's that 75 foot setback from the upland edge in the town's property. So if you put that 75, you can see that even high up on Dunstan, we're talking about being shoreland zone. You don't have to live on the shore to be in shoreland zone. These are, this is the existing structure that's on it. Uh, this is pretty much as it was when I walked in, uh, quite a mess. Uh, it's been cleaned up on the front so that uh, we can arrest the, the rot and deterioration. I have worked with my neighbors in regards to arbovitae and old overgrown lilacs and a lot of junk vegetation. It's been uh, cleaned up and I do things a little bit backwards. I've already started my landscaping to make sure that uh, everything is, is well um, landscaped. I've already put in use arbovitae, uh, rhododendrons, lilacs, daylilies, um, both, uh, all three levels of, of plants, from trees to brush to flowers, uh, to satisfy my neighbor so that uh, they're, they're pleased with the progress. Uh, out back has been mowed now, so this is some of the existing conditions that were out back. That, uh, the assessor's map would suggest that this was some sort of an automotive garage at one time. And uh, there, there was loads of evidence. There was uh, quite a few uh, dollars of dumpster fees to get this place uh, decent looking. The place is wide open, and part of the reason for the proposed removal instead of repair is the foundation is, it just looks like it's there. It's leaking quite seriously. 
the uh, existing setback is only like three and three foot three point uh, six feet away from the property line and uh, in order for one to appropriately uh, put decent perimeter drain in you're going to be right up against your neighbor doing that so it just makes more sense to remove the property remove the improved structure which is real not proof uh, remove it put some compact fill back in its hole and uh, build a uh, structural floating slab on grade therefore you don't have to get next to your property line to do that uh, it can be very low not built up high so we don't have any uh, drainage conditions pushing that drainage water off onto the neighbors and uh, I can make uh, basically my attempt is to turn it into to, from this very antique structure into this structure here which is the uh, slab on grade with insulated structural fill bottom uh, to be able to drive your vehicle this is a roof one elevation funded to drive your vehicle in you could offload if you, if you were handicapped impaired uh, or mobility impaired offload right inside the house all my doors are being proposed to be 36 inches so that there's uh, plenty of accessibility in there there'll be no deck out back it'll be a patio it'll, i don't have to elevate anything i can make it low and, and small and have the, the, the smallest footprint placed back on the property with the except in regards to the accessories entrances exits thank you any questions feel free to ask thank you um, First, I'll offer opportunity for any public comment if there is anyone here who's interested in, in this item. Seeing none, turn to the board. Uh, Nick, do you have anything? I don't have one about that either. No? no? I'll take that as a oh, yeah. positive it's a favorite, It's positive. Um, right. Thank you. Great. Susan? Um, no, I don't have any serious problems with it. I'm, I, am, um, I am concerned about the fact that this is a... Um, can I find my notes? It abuts the um, wetland. Shoreland zone. Thank you, shoreland zone. So we're going to have to watch that very carefully. Um, I don't think there's any problem with it. I can't, I'm quite frankly, it's a lot of work for a teeny little space. So I wish you good luck. I hope it turns out to be what you want it to be. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Robin? Yeah. <clears throat> I only have two questions or two concerns. Um, first of all, thank you. I think it's a great improvement that you're doing here, and you read my mind as far as bringing photos um, because I didn't get a chance to drive down and see the neighborhood kind of a thing. And I think your proposed improvements are, are uh, much improved. <laughs> um, so real quickly to <laughs> add on my colleague's um, concern regarding Shoreland Zone, um, Will you be the contractor who's doing the work on site? Are you certified by DEP's non-point source program? Uh, I'm not certified, Okay. but I'm probably qualified to be certified. You need to look into that because in order for a contractor to work within the shoreland zone, you do need to be certified. So if you aren't, then you'll need to contract with someone who is or get yourself that way. And there is a training class coming up, so I'm sure you can uh, take that. And being in business for 42 years, I'm sure that's not a problem for you. The second concern is regarding public sewer. Why why not connect to the sewer on Route 1? Um, why keep the old septic? That that really pains me. <laughs> May I address that? Sure. Just uh, make sure we can, we can hear you. Very good question. And the reason is because it's not accessible. I, okay. I, I cannot uh, approach it. It's as I correct me if I'm wrong, Jay. I think it's going to be up around the Dunson School, old Dunson Schoolhouse area which is one, two, three, four, probably in excess of six, seven, eight hundred feet away So along Route 1. Okay. So you've already talked with Scarborough Sanitary District and there's no way to pull a short lateral to, get to that dwelling? Oh, I, I have not talked. I didn't have to. <coughs> okay. there, there's just, it would have to be an excavation of the, in the right of way of US Route 1. So I, way, too, right. way too far. All right. Um, the, the present existing uh, two-bedroom uh, subsurface wastewater disposal system presently has not failed, and it looks fine. But you are will be testing that. Oh, and, absolutely. Yes. And that'll be one of the requirements the code office will make me do. Good. 
okay. even to resume the existing yeah. one. And that's why I'm not proposing to make it any larger, <clears throat> partially because of uh, Susan's comment on the, uh, the you know, and yours for the shoreland zoning. I don't want any bigger impact there, just minimize. I, I agree, but it could be a larger impact if, you know, the septic system is, does fail um, because it, you know, if it's, if, if the above surface is any, any indicator of what's below ground, then that could have some fairly major impacts to the wetland, Phillips Brook, and then the receiving Scarborough Marsh if that were to fail. So right. just right. make sure you get all your tests, dot your I's, and cross oh, absolutely. your T's. Absolutely. With the, that's part of the um, draw to having an existing structure in that you're grandfathered for the system as well. Uh, and, and I'm avoid, I'm, we will have a replacement system all queued up, ready to go. Okay. That's what I have understood uh, the code officer to be indicating that that's what it's going to be. Sounds good. Thanks. Rachel? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that you're making this handicapped accessible. Um, but as I look at the uh, hammerhead that you have there and then the plans, if you could take down the old and bring in the new. All right, so the, you have a front door that's actually on the on side. side. Yeah, it's like facing Dunson Schoolhouse or on Vine. This is facing uh, the uh, food broker in front, number one right now. All right, that's so the so the front, the, the door that you're going to use is the front door. I can see a walkway. Are you going to be connecting it? with the hammerhead Correct. to ensure wheelchair oh, access absolutely. so that that will all be available. Okay, so it's going to be integra fully integrated. As well as a side door. This is where your vehicle will park outside. This is inside. This is also handicap accessible. Okay, so it's, it's, in, it's accessible right into the house. There's no single step or anything else. Sure. Very nice. Sure. Thank you. Um, I certainly like this design better than what's there. Thank you very much for doing this. So part of the, part of the briefly the changes to those numbers that I talked to you about, the percentages. Um, I had some preliminary discussion with the fire chief in regards to the, the couple of buildings uh, here right beside Town Hall for the future uh, public safety building. And I had, uh, I, I had a mild interest in that, but in order to accommodate my desire to make a handicap accessible, there have been a lot of improvements. Public safety issues, the inside, it, it, it always is, a good idea to try to reuse buildings, but when you really do the numbers and crunch the ordinances into the, 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 the present day, it's, it's very challenging. So that's why I fast forward it. <coughs> brand new slab, brand new structure, 100% meet the ordinance. You all set, Richard? Okay. Rick? Uh, I'm very impressed with your presentation. It was very good. Thank you. I like your hand drawn plans. I haven't seen those in a while either. Um, I do have just a comment, or maybe a question. I, I'm a fan of the slab on grade as well, especially for handicap. But is that, it's not in the flood zone or anything? I mean, no. You're all set there, right? Because of the elevation, we're way outside of flood. Okay. What, what we get hit on is the overlay. When you pull the shade down, the overlay district of the TVC3 hits the shoreline zoning, even at that elevation. Okay. Because of distance to the resource. Okay. Yeah. But you're above the flood plain, yes. so you don't have to worry about yes. it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'm just close enough to see that it says slab six inches, water table six inches below slab. That kind of works. Yes. The, 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 the water table, meaning the, the, uh, the sloped insulation that goes around the perimeter, okay. will, be, will be basically covered by six inches. The water table is the skirt board at the bottom of the siding. That's called a water table. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, um, that was my only yep. real concern, and I figured you had checked it out, but I thought yep. I'd ask it. Yeah, other than that, I think it looks fine. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, <clears throat> I'm also supportive. I mean, as, uh, as Jay mentioned, you know, the, the starting caveat for all these non-conforming uses is always to try, and when an when opportunity comes up, to try to move towards something that is not non-conforming, but when that's not feasible or practicable, the way I kind of think about Section 3F is sort of like the Hippocratic Oath that, you know, first do no harm. And I think you've demonstrated uh, pretty convincingly that 
what you're proposing would not do any harm compared to what's already there um, and what's been there in the past. Um, I appreciate the, obviously, I've done all your homework and we're very prepared and very thorough and um, I'm confident based on everything I've seen and heard that you'll um, you. take care of all those details going forward in terms of stormwater and, and um, waste treatment and everything else, assuming this goes forward. So um, I think it's accurate to say we're giving a pretty unanimous, uh, a unanimous uh, positive recommendation, advisory opinion to the uh, ZBA, and uh, wish you the best of luck. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks. <clears throat> Item number five, Bell Atlantic Mobile of Allentown, doing business as Verizon Wireless, requests a site plan review for 415 Black Point Road Assessor's map R103, lot 17A. Okay. Sure, thank you, Chair. Sure. Um, yep. As you just noted, uh, so this application is before you for a transmission tower, actually on a portion of lease land at the Sanitary uh, District headquarters down off Black Point Road. Uh, the site is in the RF district, but uh, it, as well as the transmission tower overlay district um, so as part of that process there's really a three-step review process in, in going through a new tr uh, locating a transmission tower um, just by way of background really this is um, it's been a few years now since the town uh, uh, updated its standards around telecommunication facilities transmission transmission towers and um, the board saw two of these but sort of when we did that initial approval, it's been a few years, so just by way of quick background, really the, sort of the intent around the performance standards for transmission towers is really designed to provide for an enhanced level of cellular service across town while aiming to limit the overall number of towers that's required to do that. Um, so to that end, as I said earlier, there's, there's really a three-step process to reviewing a transmission tower proposal. And the first first bit is what we call our priority of location. Um, and as part of that, essentially what the applicant is asked to do and the board is asked to review is that they do a, a thorough analysis of all other alternatives based on a priority as the title would suggest. And so those priorities are, are really as follows. Um, one, would a new transmission antenna on an existing uh, transmission tower satisfy the service needs of the applicant? If, that's, if that wouldn't work, then the next priority would be a new transmission tower in the industrial or light industrial district. And then assuming they can't meet that standard, or the, again for their needs, is a, a new telecommunication facility mounted on or within a building. So these are not towers, these are smaller antennas, um, that are attached, as this suggests, to buildings or maybe inside a cupola of a church or something to that effect, if you sort of think along those lines. And then sort of if that can't service the needs, then the final item is a new transmission tower in the transmission uh, tower overlay district could be reviewed. Um, and then there's a host of review <laughs> criteria for that that we go through um, in that process in that process um, standards for the transmission towers um, there's you know maybe a dozen or so standards there and as well as the site plan review standards um, as the applicants narrative already suggests um, one of the key components in the review standards and, and I think you know the first bit we we'll want to talk about is the priority location but I'm just trying to set the stage is really around this uh, uh, visual impact analysis and the applicant has noted that they fully intend to provide the board with an impact analysis sort of do a balloon test if you will with photo simulations um, so that's additional materials that will be submitted to this board before you get to any further findings so I think tonight <coughs> is really the start of a conversation almost think of it as a elevated sketch plan, if you will. Um, I, there's no action anticipated this evening, but uh, um, I think we can really start to dig into this priority of location discussion. And then, of course, any comments or concerns the board has regarding all the other elements, but um, just sort of try to set the stage in that way for you. And staff's here to answer questions as we go. Thanks, Jay. That's helpful. And I'll just further note that, you know, again, just to reiterate, as, as you said, 
we don't anticipate any board action on this at this stage. We're really, this is sort of the beginning of the process, the formal beginning of the process. Um, there's a, a visual impact or view shed analysis that still needs to be done uh, that, that we'll, we'll all be able to review. Um, I will note too, and we'll have the opportunity for, for public comment when, once the applicant has completed their presentation. Um, we have received uh, several emails and other forms of correspondence from interested uh, residents from, from the area, um, and I won't list those all off. We've got, you know, there are several of them, but I just want to reassure everyone that we have them, we've read them, we appreciate all the feedback, and we'll certainly take your, your comments uh, into consideration as we, as we do our, our uh, diligence and discussion. So with that, I'll hand it over to the applicant. Great. Thank you. The board, uh, again, Chip Fredette here on behalf of Verizon Wireless. Uh, with me tonight, I've got uh, Scott Anderson uh, from Feral Dana and Keith Valente from C Squared Systems, our RF <coughs> engineer, network design engineer, who can answer uh, technical questions for you. Um, as uh, Jay well laid out um, a bit of the history here, um, until 2005, uh, 2015, rather, um, most of Scarborough enjoyed wireless coverage from only one site in town. And that's the uh, existing tower site that was built in the late 90s up on Scottsdale Hill Road. It's a 180-foot guide tower. Verizon co-located on that tower. In other words, we didn't build it. We co-located our equipment on that tower in 1999 or 2000, right around then. And so 15, 16 years later, um, it was time to uh, mature the network in this area. A lot has changed since then. Um, more folks have gone uh, from uh, landline to wireless-only homes, working from home. E911 has become a big issue. Uh, so wireless, of course, has developed and matured uh, in that way. And so in 2015, as Jay mentioned, um, it was deemed that the town's ordinance was antiquated. And so the town's ordinance committee, of course, worked through that in concert with you folks uh, and also um, a third-party RF engineer named uh, IDK Communications. And then uh, about a year later or so, uh, came up with a new ordinance uh, under which we're working now. Um, since that new ordinance was adopted, Verizon has developed uh, two of three projects. Uh, we put, waited until the, the ordinance was developed, came through, and then the first, of course, being the uh, Monopine Tower at 239 Broad Turn Road, 125-foot um, Monopine-style tower, uh, built to be extendable. Uh, this board reviewed and approved that. We've built it, and it's on air. Uh, the second project that we worked on under the new ordinance uh, is a co-location, is a new telecommunication facility, as Jay uh, uh, mentioned. That would be uh, C uh, under the priority locations, uh, a co-location on the Scarborough Congregational Church. Now, you folks didn't, didn't see that, of course, because that was a subject only to a building permit and admin review. So in that instance there, uh, unlike uh, Scarborough 4, again, Broad Turn Carter's property and this property, uh, there was an existing structure upon which we co-located our antennas. We took the steeple <coughs> off, put the antennas on the inside, replaced it with a, a stealth facility, a stealth steeple, uh, and uh, unless you knew it was there, I don't know you knew it was there today. So uh, surprise, you got a site there on, in, the, in the church steeple. Um, the current site uh, that we're proposing, of course, is a raw land, 100-foot uh, monopole facility at the location of the uh, uh, sanitary district at 415 Black Point Road. Uh, I've got a plot map up here on the board, and this is a propagation map uh, showing our existing coverage. And the goal of this project, we call it Scarborough 2, the goal of the project is to do two things. One, to provide coverage to the white area, okay? Green being area of coverage, so we've got Scarborough, which is at Scottsdale Hill Road site. Scarborough 3, the church steeple site. And then we've got uh, another site of note here, Old Orchard, we call it Old Orchard Beach. That's a co-location on a water tank. Some of you folks, it's uh, built around 2004, 2005. Uh, there's actually no water in the tank. Anyhow. <laughs> um, so this site here, Scarborough 3, Scarborough, and then Scarborough 4, the Broad Turn Road site, is off the map, out of view, okay? Again, here's where we're looking here. That's the proposed location of the site. And let me go ahead and flip it for you. So as with any, as with any new, new site project, um, we first start with the existing coverage map. 
understand that there's an area of need, in this case here, again, the beach area, Proud Snack, and then uh, the engineer at Verizon Wireless develops this search area, search ring, if you will. And that's the area defined in red here, okay, on Proud Snack. And there, that's their direction to me, the site acquisition person, to say, okay, if, Chip, if you can find me a site in this area here at X height, that will serve the objective of the site, be it to provide coverage to an area where there isn't any, or, and or, to offload coverage that another site is bearing, and there's, there's too much demand now on it. So this site actually has two purposes. One, new coverage, and also, two, to offload the demand on the Old Orchard Beach site. Believe it or not, that Old Orchard Beach water tank site owned by Dan Patry is actually providing coverage to parts of Proud Snack. Now, we'd call that probably unintended coverage these days because no site is designed to serve that great of a distance. There's too many users in that footprint in the Old Orchard Beach site, that particular sector of antennas, uh, can't handle the load anymore. So this site is going to do two things. Mainly provide coverage to Proud Snack and the beach area here where it's non-existent, and it will also, by virtue of that, by default, offload some of the load on the water tank site. So again, here we are. I've got the search ring. This is my, this is my direction from the engineer. Uh, and based on uh, my knowledge of the area, uh, my familiarity with the new ordinance, uh, went out, relook at the area more recently, understand that uh, the town had identified this particular parcel as uh, a, a good candidate for a new site, um, contacted the water district, they were willing to lease this property. We went ahead and uh, negotiated a lease with the water district, uh, and, and here we are. Oh. Like I said, as with any project, there's a search ring. Uh, in this case here, I, I printed this one so you folks could see. Uh, this is the Scarborough 3 search ring right here. And then I've drawn a little arrow here in blue that most of you may have trouble seeing, but uh, that's the location of the church steeple. So again, when there's, when there's an available existing structure in the ring, that's what we use. And then of course, if approved, uh, with our antennas at a center line elevation of 96 feet being the peak height of 100, this is the coverage uh, that we'll get from that, the green area here. Proud Snack and then the beach area. So I'm looking now at the site plan of the proposed uh, tower site at the wastewater treatment plant. This is C1, okay? And so we're proposing to uh, utilize the existing, we have an, a non-exclusive access and utility easement to use the existing driveway coming in from Black Point Road all the way to the point at which uh, you get to the gates where it's a secured area uh, and we will start the construction of a new access road to the right just before that and following the existing fence line of this secure area of the uh, district. busy plan and I can answer any questions if uh, trouble seeing on the screen or here but uh, so again uh, here is the existing paved driveway um, the, the lines to the right of the driveway denote the proposed underground utilities that will route from Black Point Road again underground power and telephone will run alongside of the paved driveway and then we will run them al uh, along the side of our proposed gravel driveway again which follows the existing fence line to the site here Okay. Um, the proposed compound here, again, just off of the off of the water district's uh, fence line, Com fence compound, uh, eight foot chain link fence, uh, 100 foot monopole in the center. This is a traditional configuration, uh, and then our equipment will also be on the inside of uh, here. Radio equipment here. 
and uh, we have a small turn parking turnaround right here on the water district side. Uh, might be important to note that the site itself, let me give you some numbers. So the nearest, the nearest uh, property line from the tower site is 150 feet. Uh, the next would be, I can't read those numbers, I'm sorry. Feel free to swing that mic around if you want to stand, stand closer to the plan. <laughs> so uh, the nearest property line is to the uh, southeast, and that's 150 feet. Uh, the remaining property lines are much further away, uh, 358, uh, 760, uh, 782, uh, and uh, 1,019 feet. We believe, we believe the site is a good location, uh, not only because it was what was recommended by the, by the town through its ordinance and through its review of the, uh, of the town by its uh, our engineer, but the location that we picked itself in concert with um, David Hughes, the superintendent there, is a good one because uh, we, we've got significant tree buffer between, significant tree buffer between the site itself and the neighboring properties. Um, the average tree canopy, we're going to guess, is between 65 and 70 feet. It's a healthy stand of pine trees, white pines, around the whole, literally on the outside of the entire fenced-in area of the lot here. And again, we're only carving out um, our approximately 2,500 square feet to build our facility there. So um, we believe the viewshed impact will be low. Uh, and again, we're happy to float the balloon, do the photo so people can see. Did you have anything else? Okay. Thank you. So I am going to open it up to public comment. Uh, as noted, we have received several um, several pieces of written input, which we do appreciate. Um, and I just ask that anyone who's interested. Come on up, introduce yourself, give your address, try to keep your comments to five minutes or less. I know there are some common recurring concerns or questions. Um, that said, try not to be too too repetitive. Um, and uh, with that, have at it. <coughs> One other note, uh, just as a matter of protocol, uh, to the extent there are questions, just direct those through the chair rather than to the applicant, and then we'll we'll make sure that any of those get addressed at some point. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Randy Hogan. My husband and I live at One Whispering Surf Lane in uh, the Ocean View Harbor neighborhood, uh, right off Black Point Road, directly across from the sanitary district. We see the lights of the sanitary district at night from our bedroom windows. So you would see this tower, um, which, so we're, we wanna um, express our concerns to you about uh, the, the, this proposal. Um, I did note that, the, as I understand it, the ordinance is that this is a, a section of um, town in a, an overlay district. And so the, the applicant's burden is to demonstrate that another location of higher priority on the ordinance cannot reasonably accommodate uh, their proposed facility. And that um, we need to collect some <coughs> evidence about uh, ways that other um, priority areas could accommodate the need of what this proposal has. So we're looking at what would be included as alternative sites or alternative technologies that could potentially provide adequate coverage, and I didn't hear anything like that tonight. I heard that it was an area <coughs> that was available for siting, um, but this particular site, as I understand from what I read, is an overlay district, so it's the last, as I understand it, the last alternative from all the other areas that are um, provided by the town. Um, that said, there's, uh, this tower would potentially be twice as high as the tree line. As he mentioned, there's a healthy stand of white pines. It's beautiful. Um, but this tower would rise twice as high as the tree line um, and be um, provided adverse visual impact. 
So this is a time where the town of Scarborough is in comprehensive planning update. Um, the, this area that we're talking about is featured on the town's website. There's an overview, or, um, aerial view of the marsh. We all know it's beautiful. Um, it's something that we're all proud about, the, the marsh and the scenic view. Um, this is an industrial tower that's incompatible with that, and it would um, permanently uh, destroy this view that is uh, remarkable, it's beautiful, it's uh, pride of our town. The other thing that we're concerned about um, that we asked the planning board to consider is disturbance of the natural resources around it. Um, cell towers are well-known threat to birds, and this is a migratory area. It's um, an area of bird concentration. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service um, has guidance that, quote, all new towers should be cited to minimize environmental impacts to the maximum extent practicable, including not citing towers, quote, in or near wetlands, other known bird concentration areas, for example, state or federal refuges, Rachel Carson National Wildlife Refuge being one of them, or in known migratory bird movement routes, daily movement flyways, areas of breeding concentration in habitat of threatened or endangered species. That describes for me where I live and where the marsh is. And then the state of Maine considers Scarborough Marsh the most significant of Maine's coastal focus areas. So I'd ask the planning board to um, invite the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service field office and Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife uh, to provide technical assistance on your review. Um, so again, those are our, our comments. We really implore you for, to protect this view and preserve the scenic value of uh, the area. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I appreciate the opportunity to address the board. My name is Ron Bono. I live at 6 Old Neck Road in uh, Ocean View Harbor. Um, I'd like to ask the board, if at all possible, if the board and or the town could hire an independent outside consultant to be paid for by the applicant to determine whether a location of higher priority cannot fulfill the applicant's requirements for coverage in this uh, coverage improvement. Um, the applicant has submitted, um, and also to have this outside uh, independent consultant uh, review the applicant and, and determine whether um, they've submitted substantial evidence and justification and had, has demonstrated that a location of higher priority under subsection 1AC cannot reasonably accommodate the applicant's proposed facility. Um, I think it's also important that this consultant assess whether with current technology other less uh, obtrusive options are available. I know uh, living right across from where this is being proposed, uh, I have, I had cell um, service uh, issues with AT&T. And in calling AT&T, they quickly gave me some changes to make on my iPhone that eliminated any problems I had with reception and drop calls from my iPhone. It was just a simple couple of adjustments on my iPhone that took care of the problem. So there's so much more technology out there today that to start slapping up these large towers seems to be a little bit archaic at this time. So I would encourage the board to go with an outside independent person that can evaluate and uh, make sure that as I think Ronald Reagan was once said, trust but verify that the information that we're getting from the applicant is in fact correct. The other thing that was mentioned was that some of the coverage that we currently have in that area, apparently with Verizon, comes from Old Orchard Beach. As I look at the overlay map, there's a much larger section that is located on the Old Orchard Beach town line that would have less of a visual impact on the area by putting up a tower in that location instead of by the marsh. So I would encourage the board to consider that area instead of um, the uh, current uh, request. Um, I appreciate the fact that a uh, simulation tower 
um, will be potentially located. Um, the other thing is, is that um, I know the current tower at the Black Point Fire Station <coughs> is an 80-foot tower, and that seems to have worked fine for that particular carrier. Um, I would encourage looking into whether something could be placed on that tower that would accommodate the request, and if not, at the very minimum, this tower that's being requested be reduced to 80 feet. It has worked for um, the Black Point Fire Station location, and I can't see why it couldn't work for this location. Um, other than that, uh, I appreciate the time for comment, and uh, I trust that you'll make the right decision. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? My name's Marvin Gates. I live at 423 Black Point Road uh, here. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the visual impact, I think, would be uh, fairly obvious to anybody who enjoys the, a view. Uh, I appreciate the additional cell phone coverage. I do uh, agree with the gentleman who just spoke. I think I'm so much not an uh, expert on this, but the uh, our, uh, we use Verizon. Uh, this is immaterial in one sense, but uh, we do. We did buy some device from Verizon that enabled us uh, to uh, set a little box next to the window attached to our router, and we hook up to the some satellite, and our coverage went from half a bar to just perfect coverage. Um, that's not at all what we're talking about here. Uh, I have many friends and family on the neck. They'd love to have better coverage. I understand that. I'm not trying to prevent that from happening. The one thing I'm a little discomforted by is that there's no discussion uh, from the applicant about the environmental impact to migratory birds. I mean, you're basically setting this in a wetland uh, area. There may be no choice. But there should be, in what I've read, um, you know, very amateurishly, uh, there are studies about where birds may be. Uh, for example, there's a bald eagle's nest right there. Um, when you value things in this world, uh, I value my cell phone coverage, but I value looking out my window and seeing people stopping on Black Point and enjoying the active bald eagle's nest. I have no idea if there are golden eagle's nests around. I know those are far more protected. I mean, if this was in 660 feet of the bald eagle's nest, I'm not saying it would have to stop, but you'd have to do implement through the federal government regulations in order to calculate whether this really could happen or not. You would be able to hold into them. Bald eagle, uh, golden eagle's nests have a wider area. This is about, I paced it off, 1,500 feet from the bald eagle's nest. And I have, I mean, I, there was one map in here where the area that you have that the engineers gave you, uh, this is set absolutely as close to the neck in that area. I understand the sanitation area uh, department is a, you know, ready uh, place where you could put it. They have the land, they're part of the town, I think. It makes perfect sense. But within that area, you were further away from the wetlands on the other end of it. And I also am a little surprised that, well, that's not my surprise, but I'm, what about other areas within this area the engineer gave you? Uh, are any of them, did you approach anybody? speak to anybody, see if they would like to offer, be offered a lease with it. Um, that's about it. I mean, thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Great. Thank you. <coughs> My name is Tim Fahey, and um, I live at 4 Bird's Nest Lane in scenic Prouts Neck, Maine. Uh, I, like others here, am uh, a little concerned about the um, 
eyesore that's going to be erected intentionally uh, so that Verizon uh, can uh, cover and do its job better. Uh, this is a concern for not only me, but other flighty <laughs> items such as birds. Um, I was wondering if we could ask the board, Corey, um, how the town uh, decided, deemed it, I think deemed it um, advisory to land of all the location of the 26 square miles, I think uh, Scarborough is, uh, to this location. I know the sanitation is a dump of sorts, but it shouldn't be kind of a dumped on in terms of uh, cell phone towers. I was just curious, um, was there, I know you guys have been working hard in terms of engineering because it's a hot issue for a lot of folks, um, but what are the other top, say, two items that were crossed off the list? Is there another location you can point to in all the town of Scarborough, or is it just landed uh, in this one one area? If I can, I hey uh, Chip, can I flip a map? Please. Thanks. I'm just curious. This this big red circle that Chip put in um, is the town engineer around to <coughs> kind of defend the location, or should they educate uh, me on the? Other locations that were what I can say right now is we'll we will add that to our our list oh, of, of okay. questions to to Sorry. address and uh, I don't know how much any of us will be able to speak to the sanitary district's perspective but we'll, we can get we can try to shed some light on on, Got it. on, uh, on how that process worked okay also I'd like to ask the board to uh, look into the question of and you guys maybe can answer this question um, I was uh, I heard that there's a possibility that technology has moved on so there, um, have you guys heard about this? The arrays can be put underground with a short, like four different um, antennas raised only uh, much shorter than 100 feet, maybe like 20 or 30. Have you guys heard about that at all? Um, maybe, maybe that's something that we I, can, I don't mean we, to ask you directly. Can, yeah. We can pursue that line of questioning. Um, and then also, how long is this power going to be there? What happens if? Uh, that there's a, uh, an outcry. Ha has there been a popular outcry by the people of Scarborough, Maine, that we want more cell service? Or is it just a 911 issue that we all have to kind of have this? I mean, I like more cell service too, but I can live without it. Uh, we're pretty much drenched in this kind of thing, and I'm just curious as what the uh, underlying demand might be, and, uh, and um, that kind of thing. And finally, uh, I do appreciate the time. Um, What would be the uh, role of, um, how would we dismantle it? If it didn't fly, how would we get rid of it? Is there a mandated 50 year thing? Because once these things go up, I understand that there's an opportunity possibly to, and it might be a muddled <coughs> understanding, it might be a muddled understanding, but um, it might be uh, very difficult to take it down and there might be permissions to extend them further. Thanks for the time. Thank you. Too old neck road, um, and I've got all sorts of concerns about about this proposed tower. Um, I did submit a letter outlining some of them, but the more I thought of it, I've one. I am concerned about the height at 100 feet, um, and you said that the pines there are 50 to 65 feet or something. <coughs> that, that would tower significantly over it. Would a proposed tower need to be that tall if and have other? Um, location's been considered. The Scarborough Marsh is really, it's not only the gem of Scarborough, but it's the gem of the state. It's the largest salt marsh in the state and is prized. People come from all over to um, recreate, to bird watch, to walk, to canoe, kayak, paddleboard in the marsh. And to put this industrial blemish there towering over it would just really be a, um, I hope the town would think really hard about doing that. In one of, he didn't show the visual of what this thing would look like. It's a monopole, and so you think that's not very a big deal. And on the top, there's this array. But if you measure it, that array is seven feet by 11. So that's a pretty big industrial structure sitting on top of this little pole. Um, and then there's capacity for three other arrays for carriers underneath that. So all of a sudden, we're looking at a real mess overlooking um, anybody coming up from Scarborough Beach State Park, I gotta believe that, I mean, it's right there that you're looking at it. Um, and I haven't, we haven't, I haven't we, the balloon hasn't been up, but how far out on the low tide of Scarborough Beach? Certainly people out on the water can see it. Certainly people throughout the Scarborough Marsh. Um, and certainly, I think Winnick's Neck can see it. 
because I can see Winnick's Neck from there, <laughs> and obviously um, Ocean View Harbor and all of that, and Pine Point. So major concerns about moving forward with this in this location. I think alternatives should be really investigated hugely. Um, and as new technology, several people have mentioned to me these different new technologies, this underground thing. I mean, if this thing's obsolete in a year, that's really, I mean, why would we have put it up? We can certainly forego outstanding cell service for until we've exhausted all um, options. And I am concerned about the capacity to make it even higher and add more carriers. So I think, um, given all of those, I, it really behooves the town <coughs> to protect its major resource, which is the Scarborough Marsh. And I appreciate sure it. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Bill LaCase. I'm Lucy's husband. I also live at 52 Old Neck Road. I won't repeat everything Lucy said, <clears throat> but I would just ask, I know that obviously view shed is, is a really big deal here. And I do understand they'll be testing with a balloon to <clears throat> get a sense of what the view shed would be that would be affected. I would just ask that we all be alerted when that's going to occur so we have an opportunity to take the time to observe what is actually being experimented with, with the balloon. And that's Absolutely. all I have to add. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> can I get up to ask you one question? Mm -hmm. Is that you can. You can get right Hello. back in line. My name is Ann Hancock, and I live at 47 Old Neck Road, right down the road from Lucy and Bill. And uh, our house looks directly at the Scarborough Sanitary District. But more, my main concern is for the birds that use the Scarborough Marsh. Scarborough Marsh, like you probably already know, is officially designated as an important bird area. And that's not a designation that comes lightly. Um, it's a vastly important nesting area. Um, huge numbers of migratory birds go through there. I worry about a cell tower and its impact on that migration. And uh, I just think this is a very poor location for uh, such a huge blemish, as Lucy put it. Please remember that when you're considering this location. <coughs> Thank you. Come back up. Sure. Uh, uh, Tim Fahey, Four Birds Nest Lane. Thanks for round two. Just a quick question. Uh, when might the schedule of this thing go on? Because I think <coughs> directing or... Putting a balloon up and say Memorial Day weekend might provide more ample feedback from the tourists that supply this place. Some serious bucks. I'm not sure what the schedule is. Maybe you can. Just we'll definitely discuss that right. in, a, in a couple minutes. Thank you. <coughs> Good question. Okay, so it's not tomorrow. My name is Ken Murphy. I live also at 21, at Old Neck Road, 20, number 21. Um, let's this discussion sound like a concern of Old Neck Road only. I want to tell you that um, I always remember the day I came to Scarborough and stood on that beach and, and met some very much older man than I was at the time, um, describing almost in tears because he, he was leaving town about the beauty of that place. And uh, I really do think, you know, as we, technology will keep marching on, we'll always be, we'll see new kinds of towers and new kinds of technologies, all these things that we think we have to have. Uh, and they'll come and they'll replace themselves. But once that view is, is messed up with this industrial kind of structure, uh, it's gone. And the other thing, the only other comment I want to say is that, uh, with all respect to Verizon, I mean, I happen to have and one of the other guys, AT&T, for my coverage. And I can go up and down uh, Black Point Road down to uh, uh, Prout's Neck and out on Ferry Beach, and I have excellent coverage. And it raises the question, at least in my mind, um, how did they do it without having to um, blemish the, uh, uh, the look of, of Scarborough Beach? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else?
Peggy Benoyer, 914 High Point Road. I don't believe my personal view shed will be affected by this, but as a volunteer for a number of organizations in Scarborough um, for the marsh, just again pointing out just how, how jarring this is for this absolutely lovely landscape that Scarborough really has as a treasure. So, Corey, sorry, repetitive, but I think it just bears sorry. repeating at the end of all of this. So thank okay. you. Thank you. Anyone else? <clears throat> well, thank you very much for all those comments, and thanks again for the written input as well. Um, I know we've all been taking notes, and we will do our best to make sure that the questions and concerns that you raised get addressed through us and through, through staff as appropriate. Um, so to kick things off, uh, Rick, do you have any anything uh, you'd like to ask or comment on? You know, at this point, until I, I've heard the public comment and, and some of well, that makes sense to me, but um, at this point, no, I don't. I mean, I think it's still pretty preliminary. I think that that you know, the balloon test would be a it would be because at that point maybe some of the folks would look at it and think, well, that's not that bad. Or maybe they'll look at it and think, well, it's even worse than I thought. But um, at this point, I think I'd just be wasting everybody's time to talk too much. But I've looked over all the information. But. And maybe maybe uh, out of the gate, it would be helpful to have some combination of staff and the applicant uh, just briefly talk through how that balloon process works and the timing and notification and all that. That obviously is an understandable <coughs> recurring question. So if, if I could, I just wanted to, um, so it sounds like there's a little bit of uh, uh, confusion around sort of the app, what the town's sort of role in this is. So the sanitary district is a separate entity from the town. It is the town of Scarborough Sanitary District, but they have a separate board of directors um, that are voted on and by the residents. So they actually are separate from the town government. So just so folks are aware of that. Um, we certainly work closely with them in a lot of ways, um, but uh, I, I just think that relationship's important to understand. Um, I think one of the other things I was hearing a little confusion around is, you know, this location wasn't chosen by the town. This particular location was chosen by Verizon. Um, what the town did do a number of years ago was we adopted the uh, transmission tower overlay district that was a very public process that the town undertook back in I think it was let's say not 09 or 2010 um, again recognizing um, sort of at the direction of council staff worked um, with, to try to address the concerns around um, cell phone capacity and service in town and um, had a number of experts and consultants sort of help the community work through different ways to approach those deficiencies in town. And that's how the transmission tower overlay district areas were identified. Um, and this was one of the areas. Uh, there are others in town, and we can sort of call up the zoning map to look at those as well. But um, so, so just in regards to this particular location, that wasn't sort of a town, <laughs> a town request. That's what Verizon has identified as their needs. But certainly, the overlay district was a a broader public conversation vetted through the council process with uh, a lot of due diligence that went into that. Um, so, um, and then, uh, sorry, Mr. Chair, sort of take sorry. us on a little bit different tangent. But then, to the exact balloon test timing, I know that was something the applicant wanted to address. They know that in their narrative, so we can. Sure. Oh, that was helpful. Thank you. Go ahead. Yeah, the, um, the, the balloon, the tip, just as we did with Scarborough 4 out at Carter's property there. Um, and sorry, just so as a frame of reference for people, Scarborough 4 is out Broad Turn and sort of Carter, Carter two, Brook Yep, area 239 Broad Turn Road. Broad -turn I'm going to give Road, a quick, quick review on that process because it will match this one. And folks may find value in driving uh, down some of the roads past that because you, you can see it from some locations. And it's a good rendition of what may happen here. Um, with regard to the balloon float specifically, um, we'll work to schedule a date. Uh, it'll be publicly noticed just as this meeting was. Um, we'll float the balloon. Everyone can see it. Typically, it's a Saturday with a bad wind day on the, fall on the Sunday or bad weather day. 
Uh, we usually have the balloon up in the morning by 8 a.m. Chances are good that winds will pick up, and by 11 or 12 o'clock, it's blowing over in the trees and of no use to anybody. But we'll leave it up uh, at least till noon, if not one or two o'clock, depending on the weather. Um, the, the balloon itself is a five to six foot diameter weather balloon, typically red or orange to make it easy to see. Uh, we float it. One person stays on site to monitor it, make sure that it, when it blows over, the string isn't hung up or compromised by nearby trees. Two others drive the area, all, the, all public roads. We don't go on private property, we drive all public roads. And we photo the balloon from any vantage point which can be seen. We take those photos back to the office and they uh, superimpose with the use of Adobe uh, Illustrator, or, or sorry, uh, Photoshop, um, uh, the proposed cell site to scale. Now, based on uh, the uh, letters that the town received to date, thank you, Jamel, for forwarding those to me, by the way. We've read all the letters as well. Uh, a lot of those commented on the idea that they'd prefer to see, uh, if worse came to worse, they'd prefer to see a monopine. So, The revised plans that we submitted actually show monopine as well. In other words, we're leaving it to the town to decide whether a monopole or a monopine would suffice. Here's the monopine. Sorry, again, same style tower as at 239 Broad Turn Road. Okay, um, the branch. Branches start at about 40 feet down, so well below the existing canopy. Uh, and then they go right to the top, and there's actually a canopy, I'm uh, sorry, it's a branch cap that sits on top of the 100-foot pole. It's essentially, essentially a monopole with, with synthetic branches. Um, we will simulate both monopole and monopine in our viewshed analysis and for consideration. In some cases, the monopine has its place. In some cases, it doesn't. Those you can't see work really well. I think the Carter Road site is a good, was a good sighting for a monopine. There's only a couple of locations you can, from which you can see it, and those locations are uh, not bore site or obvious or direct views. Um, and so as you're driving down Broad Turn Road, you don't really pick up on it because you're looking through trees to see a tree. And so um, perhaps some of the views from the marsh may be too obvious, and leaving in a monopole might be the way to go. Uh, perhaps a monopine is what the board chose. Either way, we'll leave it to, to you to decide. So. Thank you. I have some questions. <coughs> there. Sure. Uh, I think I like. I think I like the tree better myself, yeah. but I have to see it. Um, in the package that you supplied to us, it appears that you looked at eleven different sites. Is that accurate? Or is that? Uh, we, uh, you know what, and, and a lot of the questions from the folks here, I'm glad you asked. A lot of the folks from the questions here were related to the priority of locations. Yeah, because I've got 11 different pretty well laid oh, out. Oh, I, um, I think you're actually looking at. So a couple, couple different things I'd like to hit quickly here if I could. One is the priority locations. Two is the RF report that I included in the application. There's two RF reports. One is by our own engineer. The other is from the town's RF engineer that it hired to prepare this new ordinance. So I remember, I recall somebody asked about hiring a third party engineer. I think the board is, I think the town has done that. I think they hired Modern Grid Partners to review our application. Uh, but in addition, uh, the town already had input from a third party RF engineer who provided us with this suggested overlay uh, uh, district approach to, to town. Anyhow, um, priority of locations. So, Back to my search ring, if I could, here. Actually, back to existing coverage. So again, from the beginning, here we are with our existing coverage map. Again, the goal is to provide coverage to Prout's Neck. Okay? That can't be done from areas off of Prout's Neck. It's got to be done from Prout's Neck in the area where you're trying to provide coverage pushing outwards, and uh, uh, Keith Valente here can answer the, the technical, technical questions, but I'm just give you a basic rundown. So that's the area in which we're trying to provide coverage. It's Prout's Neck as well as the beach area. Hence the search area. Again, find a site in this location here that will work. The antennas need to be at a 96 foot center line, and that will serve the goal of this particular area here, okay? Now when looking at this search ring, the first thing I'm going to do, like I did with Scarborough 3, the church steeple size, I'm going to look for a steeple. I'm going to look for an existing tower. 
if it's close, I'm going to look for it and suggest that my engineer consider it before building a new tower. This is the approach, this is the approach we take with every project. We've got, um, it's, it's a function of height, line of sight, to, to promote line of sight from the antennas to the user, uh, and then be, of course being in the area in which you're trying to serve. Again, here's the, here's the search area here, okay? There are no buildings within the search area or close to it that will suffice on Proud's Neck. Somebody mentioned the uh, US cell flagpole at Black Point Road Fire Station. That tower is physically not capable of co-location by a carrier. That was designed strictly for US cellular's three antennas and the town's, uh, I think, one town whip antenna on top. That's it. And so, uh, and, and actually in, in the town engineer's uh, RF report of 2015, he notes as much. So that site is located right at, the, uh, you, you folks know, right at the elbow here, okay? So we walk those priority locations in every case because anything we can do to prevent from having a building tower, we will do that. Um, real quick on, so we talked about um, stealthing, uh, monopole, monopine, uh, the town's decision to make there. Uh, in either case, it could be built to be extendable. In, in, addition, in addition to the comments that I read about, uh, concerns about viewshed, there were also comments that came back talking about, well, is that tower tall enough to suit additional co locations? We don't want to have a tower farm. So in other words, uh, if the tower is too short uh, and only a couple of users can make use of it, uh, does that mean we're gonna run up in a second tower in the same area? Well, what we've committed to doing is, like we did with uh, the Broad Turn Road site, is building this tower and the foundation suitable to be extended. We don't need any more height, but know that it will be available or capable of that load should another carrier say, hey, gee whiz, that site, that's too low, they'd come before you, Permit properly, and then and then perhaps extend it if if, if necessary if, if the board approved it. Um, environmental, lots of comments uh, in the record about uh, potential bird impact. Um, doing this for 18 years, and from what I understand, the concern that the U.S. Forest Service has raised with regard to potential migratory bird impact is not with the physical structure itself. It's the lighting on a tower, which can skew the bird's orientation. This tower will not be lit. It will not have an impact on migratory birds. Yes, one of the requirements in the town's ordinance is that we run uh, a NEPA screen, run the NEPA impact. We will do that, which includes uh, review by U.S. Forest Service, um, uh, uh, State Historic Preservation Office, uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office. We'll run through all those points. That report is typically ordered when we have some sense of what type of structure and where it's going to be located. It will be approved by you folks. You know, it, once we get a warm fuzzy, I can say, okay, it's looking like a 100-foot monopine in this location. We'll order the NEPA. That way, the folks reviewing it at the uh, state and federal levels have a, a better idea of what, what they're reviewing, what they're looking at. And uh, I can speak to alternative technologies, but I think I'd rather have Keith do that if you're interested. So I think we will be, but I'll. Uh, <coughs> sure. Yeah. You have I anything don't else? Right? Have any other questions? Okay. Good job sure. yes. my questions. Rachel. Yeah, I've. Um, I, I'm looking at a couple. Of, if you flip over a couple <coughs> uh, to the proposed area. All right, that, um, that's, you know, I think that's what you have that will, would be covered, yes. that represents what would be covered. Um, what we've got in a letter from the fire department and public safety here is the difficulty of um, accessing Higgins Beach and the cell phone reception at Higgins Beach. So this proposal actually doesn't propose to do anything about that. Is that it, correct? It, it will hit portions of Higgins Beach um, the, the other, the other n point to make about the uh, public, uh, both uh, police chief and fire, is that they were interested in, uh, in uh, connecting their own equipment to this tower, which we've said we've agreed to do, and that will improve their own two-way system. So I haven't seen any coverage maps for their footprint. 
This, of course, is for Verizon Wireless, but when they put their equipment on our tower, again, at no cost to the town, um, they will conceivably have their own you know, propagation map and uh, improved coverage for their own two-way system. But it doesn't change the cell phone reception in Higgins Beach or the problems. Uh, uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say it goes. I wouldn't say it goes uncovered. It, it, yeah, because like, I, I, you can see where Higgins Beach is, and right yep, there, nothing yep, there. Yep. Um, let's go back to the Black Point Road fire station. It already has one uh, tower on it. It's not yours. That's correct. Uh, is there something against putting a second one there? Yes, the tower is physically incapable of co-locating antennas on it. No, a second tower. Mm -hmm. oh, there's, no phys there's no ground space to put a second tower there. Okay. Yeah. So you, you explored that already? Yep, with Tom Hall. Yep. Uh, did you explore across the street at Camp Ketcher and their property? Uh, I did not, no. No, we're getting, at that point you're starting to get out and away from, out and away from Prout's Neck. The other, the other piece, the, the other piece to this is that the town's ordinance requires that we look at parcels that are uh, 25 acres in size and that the t tower itself be, uh, the tower setback itself be 100%, I'm sorry, 150% the height of the tower. So again, 100 foot tower, I have to be able to achieve at minimum 150 foot setback. So it's it not just catches right across the street from Black Point Fire. Yep, yep, understood. I, I'm not sure I, I can pull up the zoning map, but it's, it's, it's not, in, like yeah, but that's that's not in the not in the it's not in the transmission tower overlay district. Okay. Um, so it's not one of the locations that was that would be able to have a new tower put on it. Right. And in terms of the construction um, that you're proposing there. Uh, that site does have some historical significance going back to the time of the Native Americans. Have you done any sort of look at that? Once again, once we have a better idea of the type of tower and the location that we might get approved, we'll run, we'll run through THPO, yes. Okay, we've got a little problem here of the, you know, the cart and the horse. Um, one of the things that we would also have to know prior to approval I think is whether that site has been examined right, right. for I guess, archaeological significance. Right. I guess like we did with the last site, I would request that we make that a condition of approval that it passes muster with, with tribal as well as, as well as SHPO as well as U.S. Forest Service. Fish and Wildlife, sorry. Um, I don't mind moving on, but I, I will have some more questions about the process they went through for, with all of, looking at all of the sites, if we can at some point get to there. Thank you. Robin? Um, I would yield to Rachel if she wants to continue talking about the priority of the locations. Sure. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Oh, yeah, we don't really have time limits anyway. So. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Then in, in that case, let's, let's go back to all of the priorities. Um, I circled all of them. So when you say that you took a look at all of these, if you could really sure. talk in detail about the existing transmission towers. Sure. So what, did, what were your findings? What, how do you actually look at them and what are your findings okay. on all of them? Again, back, I, I keep, we keep showing this map and I know it, uh, you might get tired of it. Uh, but again, this is the search area map. The goal is to find a site inside this ring or in very close proximity to it. There are no... Excuse me. So you're saying that that ring is the only possible land area where you could put a tower that would cover Prout's Neck. I'm That's correct. trying to That's correct. get all of the parameters. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that coupled by a, a, a height, uh, no, no lower than a center line elevation of 96 feet or peak height of 100 feet. Let's just stick to that number. At 100 feet inside that ring, that will serve the, the objective of the site. All right. Now, how do you determine how you get to that ring? Uh, how is the ring created? Is yes. that what you mean? Oh, okay, sure. Going back to the original coverage map. So they're looking at, looking at the fact that there's limited or no coverage along Prout's Neck, along the beaches, 
as well as uh, a capacity issue with this site here that seems to be serving much further than they're intended. From Again, this is the old Orchard Beach water tank site that shoots up along uh, the coastline here and catches some of Prout's Neck here. So the idea is that there's enough of a demand here on Prout's Neck. There's a lack of coverage, period, along Prout's Neck. Again, the white area, uh, no coverage, green area coverage, that warrants the need for a new site in that area. And so going from that map there, the engineer creates this search area here saying, find me something in this area here at 100 feet, and that will serve the objective of the project. OK, then um, next, I'm assuming, Jay, that there are no industrial, light industrial areas uh, where that would be possible. Not near this location. Uh, industrial districts are, are some distance from here. I don't know if towers, you know, that's beyond my, <laughs> beyond my expertise, if any of those towers would service. Um, but I will do, actually, this is a good opportunity to circle back to the question about peer reviews. Uh, when, again, this um, ordinance was adopted some eight, nine years ago at this point, um, we actually had a workshop with uh, the planning board, I think Corey might be the only one, yeah, Susan might have been on the board at that time as well, now that I think about it. Um, we recognize that there's certainly some technical capacity here that, you know, staff just doesn't have in terms of these RF studies and, you know, propagation maps and all, yeah. all this um, stuff. So one of the items that we talked about with the board is by, uh, just by practice, when these applications come in, we send them out for peer review, like we do with many other type of applications for stormwater and traffic. We felt clearly this was an area that we're going to need some expertise and assistance. Um, so as board members will note, you know, this was on your agenda previously. We didn't get to it due to time constraints. Uh, we did have a peer review, uh, look at it and provide a memo. Um, we have sent out the revised materials that were provided to the board in advance of this meeting, um, and we were actually waiting on, uh, we were hopeful to receive a memo on that, but we did not receive that prior to tonight. Um, but certainly, um, that's something we'll forward along as soon as we get it, and you know, we're sort of at the stage in the process where we have a bit of time, but we'll be sure leading into future meetings that we get things more timely. Um, but I just want to let the board know and folks out there know that <coughs> that process is underway. Okay, so there is no, I'm, I'm going through the performance standards. I'm on uh, C, oh, B or C now, we're on C now. Well, I think I'm uh, I'm following, B, yeah. yeah, B yep. is the, um, new new the question of the in industrial, the light industrial yes. areas. Yep. And there are none within Correct. The, the appropriate range. Okay, new telecommunication facilities. Defined by the town of Scarborough when it's only yours as, quote, uh, facilities used for wireless transmission and reception of voice or data mounted <coughs> on or enclosed within a building structure, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So we call that a building co-location uh, in slang term in the industry. Uh, in other words, uh, Sc our Scarborough 3 site at the Scar uh, Scarborough Congregational Church. When looking at the search ring for that project two years ago, there's the red search ring in this case. And of course, we identified the church steeple there, um, straight to code enforcement for that project. So that served the goal well for that, that site. And you found no other possible co-location areas. That's correct. Facilities. I wish that I did. What, what did you look at? I looked at the search area in the search ring. There are no buildings that, upon which the co-locate antennas at 100 feet uh, anywhere in Proud Snack for that matter. But there's nothing in the search ring. Sorry. So that gets us to the new transmission towers. Uh, our role as the board is to find that the applicant has submitted substantial evidence and justification. Um, and that's what I think we're trying, we're really trying to do here. Right. Uh, 
I'm struggling at it for a way to to express this. I guess the um, actually the the very basic question goes all the way back to the initial question of why you decided you wanted to put a tower, why you decided that Prout's Neck was the ideal place for Verizon to increase its transmission facilities and not some other section of Scarborough that was underserved or not served by Verizon. Yeah. So you're asking why we want to build a site here? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> because there's, ver uh, <laughs> don't take my word for it. Uh, I know a lot of the letters that were written, uh, though they're not very friendly, they did, they did admit to the fact that coverage here is weak if non-existent, both on the neck itself and along the beach. Our maps, of course, show that as well. In addition, something that some folks may not experience until summertime when the population increases is an overabundance of demand for coverage on Prout's Neck. And um, Keith, can you speak to um, phone usage and phone looks for strongest signal, i.e. OOB? Sure. Okay. I was, I was a teacher. I was a teacher in a formal life. I'm used to asking questions. Yeah, Let's I'll just keep going. Yeah, <laughs> good place. Good evening, Keith Valenti, uh, Visa Victor E L L L L E L L A N T. Um, business address is 65 Dharma Drive, and I'm with C squared Systems on behalf of Verizon RF Department. Um, so we, we prepared the RF report that was part of our application, stated January 23rd. And what that does is it kind of just goes into uh, Verizon's network in this area, um, where their needs are and how the proposed site uh, fills those needs. Um, what Chip showed and, and explained quite well is, is so the traditional um, need from a, from a coverage standpoint and you know the signal strength in order to, to have reliable um, LTE service. Um, nowadays with, with the growing usage on wireless networks, it's, it's uh, you know, everyone's reliant on them. Many people have multiple devices. Um, one of the challenges is for the existing facilities to keep up with all that demand. Um, so, in our report, we had a, a set of five or six maps. Um, Chip showed the first two. Um, what I have on the display here is the third map. And what this does is it is it provides sort of a, a color coding on what each sector of those surrounding sites presently cover. So what we have here in, in red on that old Orchard Beach site, it's effectively shooting across the water. There's no obstructions, um, so it's going to basically cover and, and, and blank the, the western side of Prouts Neck. Um, the problem with that is, is there's an abundance of usage within the Old Orchard Beach area that that site is really intended to cover. So when you have all this you know, uh, outside usage on the edge of the, on, on the, edge of the um, site's footprint, what we call it, we're talking over three miles away, um, it's sort of an unintended coverage. And what that does is it, it draws on the resources um, and the ability for that site to provide adequate service, not only on Prouts Neck, but, but also closer in the Old Orchard Beach area. Um, so as that demand rises, Verizon needs some additional facilities, sort of a dedicated facility to, to serve the, the area around it. Um, that's, that's another consideration of how we arrived at, at the proposed location. Um, and again, you know, we have, we're showing other sectors, the, the Scarborough 3, which is the, the church, showing uh, orange and yellow. Those are kind of, you know, spraying down to the, towards the south. The, the, the main sector that's, that's covering uh, Prouts Neck area is, is from that old orchard beach site on water table. Um, so if I go to the next site, next site, what we have here is shown in green, and that's what, what the proposed site will cover. As you can see, um, now that's the, the dominant site on Prouts Neck. Now we have a dedicated site with three sectors uh, serving usage in that area. It's not just one sector from a far off distance site uh, providing service. So from an overall network standpoint, 
it not only improves um, service in the Prouts Bank area, but it also enables the surrounding facilities to better serve um, the areas that they're intended to serve. In your analysis, did you consider um, what it would take to expand the sort of uh, coverage to the Higgins Beach area? You're talking about beach areas, and we we have more than one. Right. So, just to take a step back, one of the one of the challenges um, with these coverage areas is is one we can't just turn up the tower or just make the towers much taller and just cover all these areas. <coughs> uh, the primary reason is one the capacity issue. We don't want to cover a large area because of all the use you need to kind of contain what they cover. Um, so those irregular coverage patterns that we've shown on the, on the prior plots, those are largely determined by the topography of the area. Any sort of a you know, hilltop where you drop off behind, that, that's where you get that sharp cutoff of coverage. So what we're faced with is directly northeast of our proposed site, we have an elevated hill, and then Higgins Beach is, is down on the back side. So unfortunately, you, you know, the sites, we can't cover everything just from one area. That's why you know, we need a network of sites to provide a a large area of, of uniform coverage. Um, so we can't get it all at one site. Um, and the intention of this site is, is the Scarborough State Park area, Brown Snack, Black Point Road, um, and surrounding you know, residency and business. I noticed that uh, there's still one little, couple of little areas on uh, Prout's Neck that would not be covered even if this site went, goes in. So are you saying that they're low, high? Well, what? are you referring to the, the southern tip of uh, Prospect? Yep. So we and a couple of <coughs> small areas. Sure, and what you can see is that at the southern end, you have that, that hilltop. So again, from looking south from the proposed site, you're going to have that sort of drop off as you head towards towards the water going south. It's not going to be able to see over that obstruction. Um, on the coverage maps, the first two where you have the green area, um, you know that's what Verizon needs to provide in terms to provide their reliable service, the, the degree of service that they're you know, striving to provide their customers. It doesn't necessarily mean that in the white area, as soon as you get into the white, your phone just doesn't work. It's just it's not reliable. Um, <coughs> the data that you put is not going to be what, what you know, Verizon is trying to provide. And so we, we, we kind of show that on that prior map. Um, from, you know, there is some signal there. It, it's, it's coming from, I think you see that gray point. Um, I, I think just to make it visually, um, you, know, you can interpret it. We, we don't color code every sector, it just becomes a mess. Um, but you can see that little gray splotch on the southern tip. I believe that's from the, the Cape Elizabeth II site, again, shooting over the water from far off the site. So, um, it's, when you get along sh the shoreline, it becomes challenging with marshes because it, RF propagates very well over these open areas. Um, it skips over water and it shows up on the other side. Um, so you get a lot of Popping from, from one side to the other. <coughs> Just as a side note, that explains why uh, the Scotto Hill area has got these two little white spaces. One of those is my house. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> and I have Verizon, but one of those is my house, and it's a little white area. Um, but it's helpful to understand um, how this how this works. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Can I still go? Robert? Okay. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So uh, what private property owners have you talked to? Maybe perhaps in the fire department area? Uh, any any private property owners at all? Uh, other than the other than washer? Like who, who might be within that same transmission zone and have the ge geometry needed in their lot to yeah. see if they're willing to have a tower go up no, we, further away from the marsh? No, we only spoke to the water treatment facility. Okay. Yeah. Um, we, 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 did, we did so uh, for a couple of reasons. One, it was, again, identified in the town's engineer, mm -hmm. engineering review report as a, as a, as a good location. So, mm -hmm. and, and I would echo that because, um, again, uh, just trying to work within the, con the, the parameters of the ordinance, 25-acre minimum, 150% mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
I had set that up. No, I totally understand that you have geometric yeah. configurations okay. that you have to yeah. work within. I, I completely get that, and I think it's a great deal that the, you know, my sewer t bill will stay low because you're going to give them a long-term, you know, lease package kind of thing. <laughs> I get that, but I'm also trying to be um, sensitive to the ecological concerns yep. regarding if you could just push it back off the marsh, you'd be less infringent or uh, upon the migratory pathways kind of a thing. So um, I guess that's what I was trying to get at, Chip. And uh, I, with with all of those things, and I hate to say it and take the economic development outside of Scarborough, but why didn't you go to Ram Island or Cape Elizabeth? Because you could hit the same area from that yep. from from uh, that uh, point that comes down off Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, one, I don't know if one of the points I didn't make clear that maybe he can speak to this, but the, the I'll speak. Oh. There you go. <laughs> um, the site needs to be in the search area, it's providing out. coverage out. So it can't shoot it across. It can't shoot it. it. Well, it, uh, it, it is from Old Orchard, right? Right. That's what we're doing. And again, that's, that's what I was trying to mirror yeah. on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the design life for a typical mono pole or mono pine? What's the design yeah. life we're talking about here? Yeah. Um, well, it's designed to both by the EIA, it's well designed against the standards of the EIA TIA 222G. That's a Just tell me a year, wow. 20 year, 50 year. Uh, yeah, 50 years. 55 oh Because sure. I'm seeing in the uh, in the um, peer review that you had that that there is a surety that's required as far as a removal bond kind of a okay. thing, and I'm just trying to allay some sure. some I'll, some concerns. I'll, let's cut from, right to that that yep. requirement then. And yes, Verizon Wireless will absolutely post a uh, surety bond in the event that the tower goes un is it unused or or. That's what I thought. It's an abandonment clause. Okay. Yep. Um, we do it with all our sites. Um, and again, another another one of those uh, cop before the horse kind of yep. conundrums where yep. um, are we going to our engineer? Of course, will prepare an estimate. Yep. Uh, prevent provide it to you guys. You can have it reviewed. Uh, typically, it's about twenty five thousand uh, uh -huh. dollars to remove a site. You know. Uh -huh. Um, and generally what happens, I mean, I know we haven't gotten to 50 years in cell phone coverage yet. We're close. We're close. <laughs> Are we? Yeah, okay, yeah. we're getting that. Well, 1980, whatever. But, yes. <laughs> um, it seems like yesterday. Um, but I guess what I want to speak to is just the sensitivity from the public comment that yeah. this will probably remain a cell tower in, ter in perpetuity yeah. type of thing. Yeah. Okay. And can you talk about what other uh, estuaries you've, like, what's your territory tip? Where do you, do you uh, work Maine in? and New Hampshire. Maine and New Hampshire. Okay, yes. so yep. you've probably put up similar towers in other estuaries. Let me think. Um, Great Bay, Portsmouth. Scott, help me out here. Um, Bar Harbor. Okay. Um, but none down in New Hampshire, Massachusetts. Uh, let me think here. I'm just thinking of coastal zone management are we, requirements. Are we, are, we, are we concerned about the, the uh, migratory birds yep. or? That's okay. where I'm headed. Okay. Yeah. Again, with with regard to migratory birds, um, <coughs> I think I think that what the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service recommends that if at all possible, do not light the tower because again, it's the lighting of the no, tower. No, I'm right? with you. I'm there, yep. and please forgive my terseness. That's okay. We just have a very full agenda tonight, so I'm not trying to yep. sort of yep. cut you off or anything, but I'm headed in a direction to to just allay some fears sure. and, and assuage sure. some public comments here. Um, talk about your ecological due diligence and what a NEPA means as sure. far as you know, talking with IF and W and understanding yeah. because migratory bird pathways are impacted by more than just lights. And okay. I, you know, I, I you know, am just a lay person kind of a yeah. thing, but yeah. Um, I, yeah. can you talk about the ecological process or due sure. diligence that you'll be doing? Sure, yeah, when, once we have a good sense for the, the location, the type and the height of the tower, We'll send our copy of a plan to. Uh, we have a regulatory department at Verizon Wireless who handles uh, uh, the state and federal permitting for us. Mm -hmm. um, again, when we when we apply for our NEPA screening, again National Environmental Policy Act, um, when we apply for our NEPA, the plans are sent to uh, IF and W in, Inland Fish and Wildlife at the state level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's sent. They're sent to the State Historic Preservation Office. They're also sent to the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. 
and each of those governing agencies reviews our plan to be sure that, uh, for example, we're not going to impact a migratory bird path. And if we do, I've not ever seen it happen, but if we did, uh, they would handle it like the SHPO office would, for example, and say, if you're going to build it here in an effort to not impact the migratory bird path, we recommend you do this. And then we take steps from there to, to So further. talk about the timing when that would be, Chip, because sure. you know, I know that tonight we're just here talking about um, a pre-sketch plan type of thing is if this is where it's going to yeah. be. Um, if you get any type of assurities from us tonight, at what point do you move, you know, and maybe we're not going to yeah. get there tonight, uh, yeah, but at what think, point will yeah. we see the ecological slash environmental due yeah. diligence? Yeah. Typically it's a four to six month turnaround. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So it takes a long time. Yeah. And so there's a lot of due diligence that's right. involved, but in advance of that, have you pulled any beginning with habitat maps or anything just to get a sense of the significant habitat and nesting grounds that are in, that is Scarborough Marsh? Uh, no, we no we have not. We've only done the research on um, on the lighting aspect. Okay. So I, I would encourage you or, or Keith or whoever just to pull it to talk to sure. see just the sheer number of species that we're talking sure. about, and it's not just avian. It's 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 a number of other ones that we're talking about. In yep. Okay. What is the Scarborough Marsh kind of a thing? Um, some other questions that came up, I think you've identified why has, you know, what were your other top two sites and, yeah. and the duration of the tower and how will it be dismantled. But um, let's, you know, one thing that we're doing in town here is comprehensive planning and we, we have some, some projects that we know are going to be phased out over 10, 20 years. So uh, I, I am going to ask you guys to, to think 10 or 20 years out. Are cell phone towers going to be obsolete? Are we going to be dealing with more satellites? You know, I, I, I want us to think long term um, as far as, you know, the technology that, that is concerned. Can yeah. you guys speak to that at all as far as, you know, sure. the obs what is it, obsolescence, obsolescence yeah. of, the, of the industry? Yeah. Um, we, we were speaking jokingly and off the cuff that we're now 30 years into the industry on a terrestrial based network. Um, there are no signs that I can see that uh, Verizon is going to choose any other kind of technology other than this terrestrial base. Uh, network that we're proposing here um, is a considerable expense, and, th and this is one of one of uh, a couple hundred projects that Verizon is working on just in the New England area alone. Mm -hmm. Every year we've got project a project base like that, um, so we're constantly working to upgrade the network in that regard. So, um, no, there's no sign of uh, getting away from a, a terrestrial tower-based network um, to going to some other. Uh, mm -hmm satellite or anything Super. Yeah. Yeah. thank you I, I um, so what other I guess you know in other states I'm just aware of sort of the, the loaded question I was asking you too, chip and what other estuaries have you worked in sure. is there are some ecological studies that can be done in addition to NEPA type mm -hmm. of thing so when you know that there are say box turtles and endangered box turtles sure. and things like that you have to do turtle counts and things like that. So I would ask that you do go back to those beginning with habitat maps and see if there are any threatened or endangered species or critical habitats that we need to be doing specific ecological surveys sure. and ecological studies on. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Yeah. Nick. Thank you. <clears throat> so there's been a lot of good questions already asked. So. I hopefully won't be too long, um, but I do want to just kind of reiterate, you know, from my standpoint where this process really, where we are in it and what we need to accomplish specifically probably here this evening, if not this evening, the next one. But the first step is, what, have you proved yourself a need for the coverage? And I think from the data you're showing, it does appear that you proved that this is an area of need. So that hurdle one, all right, check. Yeah. Excuse me, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, no, we're, no. We're, so, we're done with public comment for okay. tonight. So that, that I feel like you have satisfied to, to an extent in my mind. Okay. Step two is have you, the location you've selected, yeah. is it the best location for this town, for the, the service area that you've identified? That's where I'm having a lot of trouble right now. And you know, I wanted to know how out of the box you've been with your thinking, and maybe you'll answer some of this on the technical side, but can you obtain the same type of coverage service or service in that coverage area 
using a network of um, those stealth cell towers that are on top of telephone poles. If you had multiple uh, locations yeah. such as that going around in that area, would you be able to achieve the same coverage? Yeah, yeah that's a good question. Uh, the answer is no, and I'd like Keith to, to speak to why. Um, lo loosely, it's because of line of sight. Again, those antennas, call them small cells, um, are no different in terms of uh, their effectiveness than an antenna on a tower. They still need to have line of sight to the user. And when you put a small cell on a utility pole and you're trying to cover a heavily wooded, large residential area, the coverage is immediately uh, inhibited by the trees that are along which the road runs. Keith, can you, can you Actually, dress it up a little bit? I was already mentioned, sort of just in, in the uh, Think, be, being mindful of time, I'll just sort of put out there that those type of activities actually were something that was reviewed as part of the process and are explicitly um, not allowed for in the community. Um, so that could be a broader discussion about why they are or aren't, but in terms of this board's job and applying the ordinance, I just want to let you know that that's not an option that's available to Verizon at this time. So um, that. for what that's worth. So next, the follow-up question to that would be yep. the, um, and I'm referring here to the uh, IDK communications 2014 study of those sure. locations. It, I assume you guys didn't write this, but you're utilizing it in your package material, yep. correct? So there's a statement here. So the three, there are three Highland Avenue. Five, I'm sorry. Of the six locations, there are three that are not feasible for providing additional space for carriers. The three are Highland Ave Fire Station, Black Point Fire Road Fire Station, and Springwood Park. The three wireless facilities at these locations are 90-foot monopoles with antennas located inside the structure. So you have, so what we've established is that the Highland Ave, I'm sorry, the, is it the Black Point or the Highland? Black Point. Black Point. Black Point. Well, all three of them. Are, well, it, Highland's right at the corner of quick, 70s. Quick, quick background on those. So, well, all, that, all three of those sites were developed by U.S. Cellular in around 06. Yeah. They were cho those sites were chosen at the time, 2006, because the ordinance was antiquated. However, because they were deemed a municipal use, they didn't require your. They didn't require your review. So they they snuck through, under that premise as a municipal use. I.e. the uh, 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 I think it's the fire station that has a whip. Of course, not the Black Point Road one. So they were able to work under that that angle. When we came in 2015, we said, "Gee whiz, um, we'll wait until you update the ordinance because it's we'd wind up with use variance requests all over town." So I'm going to go back to the Black Point Road fire station. You sure. There's a 90 foot pole in there. And there's no room for any other carrier service. Is that correct? It's not designed. It's correct. Yeah. There's no physical space. So, what are what are the options, the possibilities? Is it even feasible to replace that existing tower with an expandable tower <coughs> that's 100 feet tall? No, because there's no there's no ground space to do to add our equipment either. No ground space. No ground space. Right. It's not just the physical space in the town. So you have to, you'd have to tear down the pole. Mm -hmm. You'd have to get town and U.S. cellular's approval to do so. You have to put up a temporary cell site. You know, then the last of it, of course, would be the ground space we need for our antennas. I'm sorry, our radios and our backup generator. And there's no physical ground space on that lot to do it. That's what prevents you in that location from doing anything else. Well, I'd say tearing down the tower is a, a fairly insurmountable insurmountable task. I think it would be that hard. But I don't know. I don't tear down towers for a living. So, all right. Um, and then you've tried, you know, I, I, you know, you're in a really prime location there, right on the marsh. And that's, I think that's what I'm really having trouble with is, you know, just coming to grasp that there really literally is no other spot you could put something that works here. Well, let's look at and, the zone. Look at the zone. The answer to that is really, I mean, that's what it boils down to when we talk about the, the location portion of your hurdles, yeah. right? Is, is this the best location? And if you say that there's literally no other spot you can put a tower that will give you service in that area, that's that's what I'm, ha I've, I'm you know, I'm not 100% convinced that all of that has been explored. And maybe I'm the only one sitting on this board that thinks that, but yeah. it's just it's a hard pill to swallow that putting one on the marsh is deemed the best, <coughs> the best spot and only spot. Keith, can you speak to the purpose of the search range? In the in the, 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 I think I think that's where we need to go with this because, um, yeah. on the one you've got if if, if once, before Keith explains the searching again, um, 
once you understand the idea of why the searching was drawn, searching was drawn there, then we look into local zoning. Okay, we've got the transmission tower over the district that's established there. There might be two or three parcels uh, in that district that qualify under the town's ordinance. In other words, they're 25 acres in size. You can build the site in a location that meets those setbacks, and they're fairly stringent setbacks. Not unlike other communities, but it's a fairly stringent one at 150%. That could be increased to 300%. Okay, um, the site was chosen here. Uh, the wattage was chosen here because um, one, it's in the district. Two, it's 27 acres, so we meet that, that minimum lot size. Three, we can meet the setbacks in that location. And four, it's already, it's a developed use. It's a developed parcel. It's an industrious use. And we felt that our use would sit well better with that than another, uh, the state park, for example, that's more than 25 acres or I think the spray gland is much larger than that, but it's untouched, it's vacant land. So rather than marring or scarring a lot that's otherwise unused or, more, or held in higher regard, as I would imagine, we opted for the water treatment plant. All right, thank you. So maybe the better way for me to phrase, I mean, you don't have to go much further than what you, we already, you're doing fine, Chip. Mm -hmm. But the, <laughs> what's the backup plan? If we say no to this, right. where does Verizon go? That's, that's what I want to know. Yeah, I don't know the answer to that right now. Um, got a lot of words <laughs> here. And just to, um, for the public's knowledge, I heard it a couple times, like, you know, the expandable tower, this thing could get higher and higher. And I think hopefully now you can appreciate why this board would probably favor expandable towers, because if the trouble in locating one to begin with, and two, how many towers do you want to see? Or do you want to see it 10 extra feet at the top of one that's already existing? So I, I hope the public can at least appreciate why the board would come to that conclusion more often than not, including if maybe you were had a different tower in there. A little bit more space, we could use that. But then, anyways, that's not going to help us tonight. Sorry, a couple more. No, that got answered. That's it. I've, they've all been answered. <laughs> Your turn. I'll try to find one, right? Thanks, Nick. Wow. I live across the street from Ocean View Harbor. Been there all my life. I moved in there when Ocean View Harbor was just a gravel pit. And we just dumped everything in the gravel pit. It had no value whatsoever. It was the same time in which we sprayed for mosquitoes with DDT. It was the same time in which we put cars and rubber and, and tires and anything else we wanted to in the marsh because it didn't matter. My grandmother, never mind, that's enough. You get the story. So along comes Rachel Carson, and she says DDT. The marsh gets cleaned up. Uh, ducks Unlimited says, oh boy, there's fish in there, so now there must be ducks in there, and we're going to hunt them. So now we've got state laws about what you can and can't do with the marsh, and boom, look what we've got. We've got one of the most wonderful resources, certainly in this state, and I swear in all of New England. And I've fought for 18 years on this board to keep this from happening. This is absolutely improper. It should not be there. If you don't like your cell service, too bad. Keep your landlord. <laughs> I just don't get it. But then again, I'm old and technology doesn't appeal to me very much. And I do have a cell phone and I text and all of that. But if I can't get it from my backyard, I go to my front yard. And if it's really important, I pick up my landline. Heaven forbid, landline. How crazy is that? I have no sympathy for this whatsoever. <coughs> I really want to just echo the fact that I want to make sure that the applicant knows that there are all sorts of people who can talk to you about what would happen to all the birds on the marsh if you put that tower in there. Lights, maybe not. But, you know, shall I run down the list? Oh, I would love to run down the list because I can't find where I put the list. But anyway, the eagle was mentioned. You know, we got, we got um, waders. We've got um, incredible. Clover. Pardon me? Clover. Clovers, yes. And of course, they're endangered. Um, terns, herons, egrets, they all make it their home. Now, 
I seriously doubt if I'm going to get a chance to say this again, which is why I'm being so pedantic about it, because I don't think that there's anything that we're going to be able to do to keep you from doing this. Because after all, technology wins. But it's not right. It just isn't. I would like to suggest, and I don't, this thing about we can't change the towers that we already put in because they were put in the fire station and the church when these, if, get me, correct me if I'm wrong, when the laws were different, so they could be a different size, and now we can't put any else, we can't add any more to those. Well, what I can sort of talk to about the Black Point flagpole slash tower. <laughs> okay, that's a very um, large flagpole, yes. Yeah, so I think it was already alluded to is that when that was approved, that was actually approved as a municipal use. Right. Um, because the um, No, I understand municipal the town use will do it. Yeah. Had its service in there. I believe the tower is actually owned by the town with a lease agreement yeah. to um, whoever the provider is. I think so here's my so here's my reason for asking anyway. poor planning because we weren't going to need anything more than that. That's sort of like, oh no, we're not gonna to have to worry about taking those towers down because we're gonna be using the same technology that we're using now 20 years from now. I, I, I don't really believe that. I'm married to an engineer and yeah, I'm, I don't really believe that. But anyway, um, I have a question. Why is it bad that Old Orchard Signal is coming to, to Proustnet? <laughs> Why, why is that a problem? I mean, I really am asking that because I don't understand it. Sure, sure. It's bad because Old Orchard Beach, that area which, in which that site is intended to, to serve, uh, is, has enough users in the footprint. And we're stealing them. Correct. <laughs> uh-huh. Okay. I'm going to stop. I just think that I want to go uh, uh, underline the fact that um, it's going and checking with the ecological um, commissions and committees and departments in the state as soon as you possibly can. If you, yep. if you anticipate that you're going to want to hang around here and make this happen, you're going to want to find out exactly what you can and can't do when it comes to all of the eco ecology of this area. Um, personal, please know, um, what is it called, um, monopine. This is, this is Maine. You know, we call a dog a dog, and we call a clam a clam, and when, and when you have a tower, it's a tower, and we're going to put greens on it, and somehow that's going to make it better. That's just personal. I don't get it. Um, but I do think that um, you need to educate yourself more than you are right now on what it is that's going down there. And by the way, because of this, let's assume this happens. If people start to complain about not having any service at Higgins Beach, we're going to have to have another tower, right? Because you can't use this one, and they don't have any other place to go. So we're going to say to Higgins Beach, I'm sorry, we're not going to give you any more power because we don't, um, any more um, towers because you're not big enough. I, I think this is, I think this is a catch-22. I really do. I understand that there are people who are not getting good service down there. I don't get great service where I am on Black Point Road. But I just don't think it's worth doing this on the, on the marsh for people who've got iffy cell service. There was one more thing I wanted to say about it. Higgins, I guess I didn't do that. Um, no, I guess that'll have to do. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Um, obviously, a lot of great comments and questions already from the public and the board. Um, I'll try not to add too much to the time we spent on this, although I think it's been useful and necessary and will certainly be continued. Um, I definitely cannot compete with Susan when it comes to, uh, to, to tenure in that part of town. I live on the Pine, it's more over on the Pine Point side. Um, I fly fish at Ferry Beach and Pine Point. Um, my kids and I take part in the, the marsh and beach cleanup every year with Audubon. Um, I value that resource as much as, as anybody. Uh, and I share a lot of the concerns about the ecological impact and the view shed impact. That said, we do have we do have this ordinance that was developed, I'd say fairly painstakingly. Um, this ordinance includes this um, overlay district, uh, which the applicant has 
correctly pointed out, they, they sort of followed their, I understand the concerns absolutely and I share many of them and I don't know which way we'll end up going on this, but I will say that we have a process that's in place per this ordinance that sort of steers this. And so I think it's a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a misstatement to say that the applicant or other, or anyone is saying this is the best site <coughs> given, given the, what clearly is a demand for service um, and the way that our ordinance is set up, this is, and, and given what I think on balance has been a, a pretty thorough uh, following of the priority site uh, protocol, this is sort of the least bad site, if you want to put it that way. Right. Um, and the ordinance, as Jay and others have described and explained, is, it really is a balancing act trying to, um, you know, the council and others created that ordinance um, recognizing that on the one hand there's growing demand, on the other hand we have these resources that we want to protect and we want to be smart about how we direct it. As with a lot of things in town, a lot of the built environment up and down Route 1 and elsewhere in town, there are things we can all point to that we say, geez, you know, look what happened, look, look at the stuff that happened before we had better planning in place. Um, there's got to be a cutoff at some point and we're just a little bit past that now and we're sort of dealing with this first generation of these projects coming through. So all that's to say that I, you know, I share a lot of the mixed feelings um, and I look forward to um, seeing more of the continued diligence in terms of the, the visual impact assessment. Um, I would also, I would echo my fellow board members, including uh, Susan and, and, and others, encouraging you to really be proactive about um, looking at the ecological um, impacts and um, I would suggest and really request that you, um, to, to Robin's question, line of questioning about other experience that Verizon has had in other coast sensitive coastal settings, that you uh, do a little bit of homework there and be prepared to come back and share with us what concerns and solutions were employed in those cases and sure. to the extent there are actual sites that people could see, that would be helpful too. Um, you've mentioned the site, you know, Scarborough Foresight. I think something that you know that might be a little more relevant would be something that's in a somewhat similar coastal setting, uh, with some, because you know these these questions come up all the time, and I'm sure that Verizon and others have encountered it in a lot of different environments. Um, so I guess you know I'm I'm as I think you know, most of my fellow board members are sort of reserving judgment until we uh, see more. Uh, sure, it's a it's a unique process. It's a challenging process in a lot of ways. Um, I'm sure it's kind of frustrating, regardless of where you are in the process. Um, and as a board, I think we've got maybe two of these under our belt now. So um, we're, I think, getting better at it. But um, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot of technical information. The peer review helps. Um, but you know, we will do our best to continue to digest it all and be thoughtful about it and trust that you'll be responsive and We'll see where we go. Great. All right. Great. Yep. Thank you. All right. We've been at this for over two hours. I'm going to um, suggest we take about a five minute break. Then we'll come back and we will resume our agenda and we will see how far we get. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we cannot take up any items after 1030. So if you're very far down on the agenda. <laughs> Watch the time. Thank you.
All right, check. Yeah.
The reason that, but we have to know. Item number six, Mazoan Development LLC requests a sketch plan review for a 20 lot conservation subdivision, Ridgewood Farm at 28 Burnham Road, Assessor's Map R1, lot 10. Jay? Actually, I'm going to turn oh, this to sorry. Jamel. He's going to take no. this one for us. All right, thanks, guys. Um, so, as the chair said, this is a sketch plan for a conservation subdivision located at 28 Burnham Road um, in the RF zoning district and also the aquifer protection overlay district. Um, just as a reminder, sketch plan review is an opportunity for the board to just have a discussion about the project, uh, giving the applicant feedback, and it's for informational purposes only, so no binding decisions. So the applicant's proposing a 20 lot conservation subdivision. Um, again, this is probably a review, but the intent of a conservation subdivision is to protect the town's natural resources and waterways. And it also requires 50% or more of the parcel to be maintained as open space. Um, so just going to go over some of the comments we had. Um, a wetland delineation on the site is needed. Um, and the board has been peer reviewing wetland delineation. So that could be an option if you so choose. Um, future connectivity to adjacent properties is important in this parcel. Um, the applicant is has shown some easement, proposed easements, at uh, the dead ends of, of the two proposed roads in the project. Uh, we'll like to know the applicant's overall stormwater approach, stormwater management approach for the subdivision. And also the open space uh, borders Scarborough Land Trust owned lands. Um, so there's an opportunity for contiguous open space um, with this project, which is really, I think it's an exciting, exciting thing. The applicant has requested a waiver for providing a sidewalk along the roadways. Uh, the ordinance does require a sidewalk for a development such as this, so the board will want to discuss that waiver request. Um, fire suppression, uh, the applicant will need to coordinate with the fire department on uh, locations for either a water tank or fire hydrants for the project. And then finally, the applicant uh, has not prepared a net residential calculation on this submission and will need to going forward. Uh, it appears that the 20 proposed lots may not be possible given the size of the parcel. Um, and the design standards seek to ensure clusters of three or more lots. Um, it appears that lot one in the project is not consistent with these standards. So I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Uh, and with that, I will turn over to the applicant's representative. Great, thank you. Steve Blake with the H2M, I'm representing uh, Development. Um, Jamel kind of outlined, I guess, the um, <coughs> most of the basics of the project. Again, it's a, it's a proposed 20 lot conservation subdivision. Um, it is, this is uh, a sketch plan, as you know. Um, it doesn't benefit from uh, detailed design. Um, and, and really, even, uh, we haven't done a we haven't completed a wetland study yet uh, before the topographic survey. There's a boundary survey done. Uh, so there's still some, some field work that needs to be done to um, kind of confirm some of the resources and, and, and how, how this would best fit into the land. Um, and, and that will come probably in the next several weeks, hopefully. Um, well, I was hoping that until the tomorrow. But anyway, um, so yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing that, or, the, the biggest items that we were hoping to get out of this um, were uh, discussion on um, the sidewalk waiver, if that was something that, that the board would consider. Um, and I guess it's not, it's not something that, you know, it's not a, it's not a deal breaker for the project, but um, it's just, this is in kind of a rural area. There are these sidewalks on Burton Road. Um, there's, there are no sidewalks in the subdivision. Um, so that was one thing that we kind of wanted to touch on. Um, and the big reason for that is it affects the way we design the, the roadway system and also the, the stormwater design. Uh, and then also there seems to be some variability in the road section for the rural access road. Um, that was the other thing that we wanted to touch on in terms of what the appropriate name would be. Um, there isn't public water or sewer in this area, so each of the lots would be on um, a private domestic well, individual domestic wells, and also individual um, subsurface. 
use of wastewater disposal systems. Uh, one other thing that uh, maybe isn't reflected on this sketch plan, at least on the subject <coughs> plan, is that this is part of a, uh, what we show on the sketch plan is about 45 acres, um, but it's part of a, about a 95 acre parcel. Uh, so uh, Mike Vizoyan is under contract to acquire uh, 45 to 50 acres of that overall 90 acre parcel. There's an existing farm farmhouse there now that would remain there. And that's that the farmhouse is the farmhouse and the farm on the back side of lots 18 and 19. Yeah. So <coughs> all set? I'm good, yeah, thank okay. you. Yeah. Great. After that last item I'm I just want to make sure. <laughs> um, we'll start off this time, Susan. <laughs> really? I could you review that last part that you just shared? There are how many more acres that have not included in this? Uh, about 50 acres. So. And is it's under consideration to be purchased? No. 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 Okay, it's just we need to, is, is that got anything to do with the uh, right of way at the end of both of these streets, providing access into future development? Um, well, I think, I mean, I think that's a requirement to, to do that. Well, yeah, but I'm just making sure that. We're not proposing to develop those areas. Okay, I was right. just curious because I hadn't thought about that, but now I'm thinking, hmm, another huge block of land. <clears throat> it makes me want to talk about how, how, how a budding would, would work, but I guess, I don't know why I had to do that. Um, okay. Just, the, the thing with the um, street lights, I went out there to check this lot out today. I haven't been out in that part of town in a long time. Anybody who doesn't know what sprawl is needs to go out and take a look at this. It is practically in Degorum. I mean, it's way out there. And it's very rural. It's one of the problems that I have with when we do these conservation subdivisions, which I think are really very worthy. But one of the problems is that you create a little village in the middle of, in this case, a lot of open space. So part of me says, yeah, but it is going to be a little village, and we should have sidewalks and street lights and street trees. And the other half says, yeah, but it really is a little village in the middle of the country. <laughs> so maybe we don't need to have that. And I really don't have an answer to it. I mean, I, I don't, personally, maybe the board can individually go to that question because I'm kind of torn. Um, I tend to think that it's not necessary, but maybe it's something that they have leave room for, or space for, or build into future considerations. Um, I think a very, very important, of course, to us here on this board is um, the town's aquifer protection overlay district. So <clears throat> I'm glad to know that you're aware of it and will be very careful especially when you're talking about wells and septic systems and so on, and the wetland delineation. There was a question in here is to seek review of the wetland delineate, um, a, a peer review of the wetland delineation. I'm always in favor of peer reviews, um, especially in a situation like this. It's a very complex wetland area and very important. So I would, I would be on the side of yes, having a peer review. Um, I don't think there's an awful lot else. Um, have you had any discussions, or do you plan to have any discussions with the land trust, since they're your abutters? We, we will speak with them, yes. OK. And I'm thinking particularly in terms of uh, trail um, accessibility. and People are going to be using that land because they live there, and how do, how do, you, how do you, the developer, um, plan for that time? Of thing. I'm sure the land trust would be more than happy to, to join you in that discussion. 
the notes from staff also suggest that uh, in a pre any meeting uh, with M uh, the main DEP include the town engineer. Mm. And what was this one? Uh, right the, oh, that's the sidewalk, yeah. I don't think that at this particular point, I mean, to me, this is one of the areas in which it's quite clear, to me anyway, that the conservation subdivision works best with this piece of land because it leaves some really nice, roomy, open space. So I'll be interested to have more information on um, is there going to be an opportunity for people to come in and park the car and be, have access to this? Is it going to be held by a homeowners association for this particular community? You know, that the use of that open space is something that we'll be looking at further down the road. Okay. All right. I think that's all I have to say at the moment. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. Nick? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so on the sidewalks, typically I, you know, one of these type of neighborhood deals, um, I would typically say I don't think you need a sidewalk. Usually the traffic is limited to the neighborhood itself. And, um, but where you have two potential interconnections here with maybe future developments, I, I do think a sidewalk would be a bad idea in this instance. Um, it's the way I'm leaning. Not that I couldn't be convinced otherwise, but I, I think yeah, I worry about what type of development, uh, how big this development mm -hmm. could become down the road, and uh, whether or not it becomes a safety issue, depending on if that <coughs> land ever gets developed or uh, what's on the other side of the conservation trust. It's not labeled on this map. Yeah, there are a few. Um, classifies smaller residential properties. Uh, Hanson Road isn't too far from there. It's broken over 200 feet. So what's on the, um, on the northeast boundary there? Well, I guess it's the northeast, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Be east, yeah. That's the Up there top right. Yeah, that's the remaining part of the parcel. The cell end. Yeah. Right to the top, that carries all the way around the corner? It does. It does, okay. Um, so there's a lot of land there. Yeah, other than well, the land trust is there as well. So I think in this instance, I would probably be in favor of a sidewalk. Um, that's why I'm leaning at least. Um, I don't have a problem with the way lot one is designed in this. I know it, it's one of the things that uh, was outlined that it should be in a clumps of three, but I think the way you have it laid out is fine. That's about it for my comments at this point. Thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump in on a couple of these items just to weigh in. Um, uh, I also would like to see sidewalks um, just to sort of a general livability and, and public safety measure um, in the neighborhood. I know it sometimes has been a little bit hit or miss, but um, that's been something that we've generally been trying to promote. Um, it's not quite the same thing as like a Route 1 sidewalk where we're trying to create a whole network, but this is more of an more within the neighborhood, so uh, that's where I am on that. Um, look forward to seeing a wetland delineation. Um, I also would like to see a peer review of that, uh, the wetland delineation, vernal pools, and so forth, given the, the location within the aquifer protection overlay district and some of the other sensitivities. Um, glad to hear that you'll be reaching out to the land trust. Um, and then, as always, with these conservation subdivisions at this stage, I just encourage you to make sure you I don't see any glaring issues, but just make sure, try to keep uh, wetlands off of actual house lots. And then going forward, as we get closer to actual approval, um, as Susan kind of alluded to, we'll want to see some evidence of sort of what what protections there will be and, and um, to sort of uh, HOA regulations or whatever other measures may be taken, including possible hardscaping, just to make sure that we're protecting uh, from infringement on, on any wetland areas that might be close to house lots. So uh, beyond that, I don't really see any any uh, big issues, and I'll just look forward to seeing the, the next uh, stage of things. Okay, so. Robin? <coughs> 
Yeah, I think Broad Term Farm is uh, that which you're abutting, that's owned by Scarborough Land Trust, is is another jewel of Scarborough, mm -hmm. quite frankly. And you have a real opportunity there, I think, to make some really meaningful open space in this conservation subdivision. So I'd be looking forward to some real creative use of um, the open space. Um, I do have a question for staff as far as what the sidewalk. Um, sidewalk um, design standards might be? Or is there opportunity for um, sort of impervious pavers or things like that to be used for, for sidewalks? Or are they strictly asphaltic or, or the like? So, and Angela, I don't know if you want to chime, why don't you start? <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, it doesn't prohibit them. So, I mean, it can be a, a conversation for the planning board to have, yeah. I think. And it can be something that we have a conversation with Public Works, if that's the direction yeah. we're thinking. Um, and I, I think we're open to looking at all kinds of options. Okay. So maybe think about some real creative ways to incorporate the, the sidewalks mm -hmm. into that real still rural character in that area. Um, I, I um, echo what my board members have already said regarding wetland delineation. And before I even looked at staff comments, I thought that there might be too many lots proposed here. I think 20 is, is, is kind of pushing it, especially in an aquifer overlay district where you're going to have drilled wells and you're going to have subsurface uh, wastewater one next to each on the edge of, um, and I, uh, Broad Turn is an organic farm, so so that's, you know, a, a different uh, question, but I don't know. You just, you got a lot of things going on in the subsurface environment, and um, I'll be interested to look at uh, your soils test and, and the like on, on those to see where we are on, uh, I guess, the health and the ability of the soils to, um, accommodate as such. Um, also with respect to stormwater management, I think we could be a little more creative than wet ponds and underdrain filters and, and that centralized sort of stormwater management. It might be nice to have buffers and, you know, sort of other, other types of BMPs that really go with the rural agricultural her uh, character out there. So that's what I'll be looking for. Certainly buffers are something we would definitely consider. Cool. Thanks. Rachel? Uh, I too would like to see the, uh, the sidewalks here uh, and also to point out that um, we have run coming into the, the correct time to take a look at the vernal pools tonight and tomorrow uh, being accepted from that. Uh, I'm a little concerned about the wetlands that look as though uh, they're going across what's going to be a road and I want to take a look at how that is treated. Um, I don't know how I feel about lot one. It's kind of sitting out there uh, and it doesn't exactly fit to the uh, conservation criteria, conservation subdivision criteria, <coughs> because it is as separated as it is from the rest. Um, I guess uh, along with, with the rest of the folks, I, I think this is a good design. I like the interconnectivity, the potential. I got a little confused uh, by your talking about additional land, and I wasn't clear whether it's attached. It, it might be attached. It's what? It is. It's so the, the existing parcel is about nine, is about 90 acres, um, and what Zoyan development is acquiring is about half of that. So the remaining land is area over here. And, and is there any, uh, so with Mazoyan acquiring that, uh, are there any plans that you can share? He, he's only acquiring this, this portion that we're showing on, on the plan, so this, okay. this half of the land. The, the remaining land is remaining with, uh, with the current land. Okay. Uh, what's the name of the stream? Does it, is it named? It is. Silverbrook, all right, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Rick? Um, I don't really have a lot, sorry. I don't really have a lot to add from what, to what everybody else has already said. Where's that future right away go? Is that is that gonna go over to that next road? That's the only thing I missed that, sorry. 
future. The future right away that's shown on the plans at the end of the road. <coughs> this one right here? No, the other one. Right um, away to where? Right now, right, right now it doesn't go anywhere. Uh, there, there, are, there are a few uh, existing houses on that side that are on Hanson Road. Um, I mean, it's really, I guess, just uh, kind of a placeholder in the event that um, something ever needs to get connected through. There's certainly no you know, intent from, from the developer that this right. Okay. Yeah, because it actually looks like it looks like it crosses right over that Silver Brook, which <clears throat> yeah, I mean the I think I think Silver Brook has a crossing on Hanson Road, I believe. Yeah, it's crossing Yeah, I don't really have anything out everything they said, especially Raleigh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Uh, so just to quickly recap, uh, we'll look forward to the wetland delineation, which will be peer-reviewed. There seems to be a, a strong majority in favor of sidewalks, so basically opposing uh, the waiver of the sidewalk requirement. We'll see where the land dress discussion goes, all the other things we've talked about. Uh, is there anything, anything else you need from us at this point in terms of feedback? Yeah, I mean, the only other thing, and I don't know if I can get uh, their direction on it yet, but it's the lane widths that we might be looking for. And I talked to Angela a little bit about this. And I think if you know on, if on one side of the road there's a sidewalk and curb, um, then we certainly would want to be less than 11 feet on, on that lane. And I would assume probably the same on, on the other side. It just has an impact on how we design the stormwater. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what that road section should be. I would say, and others can chime in, and I'd certainly welcome any comment from Angela. The board's generally been fairly flexible on lane width in, in these types of developments um, based on different constraints and just the character of them. But yes, there, do you want me to? I guess yeah. my, my guidance um, to Steve was really looking at, um, like you said, I know the board has been open to reducing the lane width and in a rural setting where you have shoulders and ditch, um, we've it, you can go down to as, as little as 10 foot lanes, so that's a 20 foot section. But I know in um, areas where we're talking about the cross section actually shows, as Steve alluded to, the cross section shows a curb and side, an Esplanade sidewalk on one side. And when you start introducing the curb, Public Works likes to see 11 foot lanes. That's mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. um, an issue for them with some of these more narrow, but it's really when you have that obstruction. So, um, that's that's their comfortable level, I think, is 11 foot. But uh, I think in a rural setting, when it's wide open and shoulders, 10 foot works. So it's really about how you design it, too. So okay. <laughs> I know that was, yeah. <laughs> it wasn't the direction you wanted. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> but it's 10 or 11. How's that? <laughs> I think we have, I think we generally have a mandate here for sidewalks at this point. So yep. given that. But you can do sidewalks in different ways too. Right. I mean, you can yeah. do uh, you can still do a ditch, so, and you can have an offset sidewalk sure. that kind of meanders through, which is actually sometimes a lot more pleasing for the neighborhood. So we'll, we'll let you do some study on that. But I think it's <laughs> I, I think it's fair to say we'd, we'd be willing to entertain narrower lane width, given you know, depending on how the design works out. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I apologize if these questions are premature. I'm just trying to get no, that's okay. This is the time to put all that stuff out there. Thank you. So, thank you. Corey, if I might, just sort of recognizing um, that I, I don't think it was quite um, clear, at least not in my mind, maybe others, the, the connection to this property, to the uh, <coughs> budding 40 or 50 acres that are remaining, I think we want to be very mindful of where the um, future right-of-way lines um, direct us in terms of the other property. If the property owner is willing to sell off 45 acres for development now, who knows what the future will hold. Um, maybe they'll hold on to it and it won't be developed, but um, there's also opportunity for future development. So I think we'll want to explore as this moves forward um, the uh, opportunities and constraints on that remaining land. Um, mm -hmm. 
and really be sure we're locating this sort of uh, right away tag in the right place. Mm -hmm. um, right now, it's sort of right where the land trust land and the abutting property come. And I understand you just sort of extended the dead end, get that, but so I just sort of echo or put that out there for consideration and the board thinks that's a good idea, then we can work with the applicant on that. Otherwise, I'll be quiet. Does that mean we should probably look at what's on the other side of that line? I mean, is there a natural feature on the other side of that property line? Then? The, the, uh, we included a copy, or at least an excerpt of the assessor's map in the application, and that might kind of show the area a little bit better. One you're referring to, Steve? The next one. Nope. One more? Well, that's, that's the catch -up. I think the next one is a little bit more clear. Okay. One second, I need to zoom back out. So, so the, the blue outline is <coughs> the 45 acres. Ah, wrong. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> that last one was. Right. The, the blue outline is the, four, is the 45 acres that. Kind of see the remaining parcel down there. So, it's like, so Silverbrook does a bisect down abutting parcel to the west. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Jay, now that we have this in front of us, yeah, I'm sort of recapping what the, the, the issue you're, you're highlighting. Sure. I mean, I think this. Uh, Trapper John subdivision is a good example. Maybe had there been left a 50 foot wide right away connecting to this property, you know, whenever years ago that was developed, that could have been an opportunity for interconnection. So, you know, just being sure right now, I think what they're showing is a connection in the location where I'm putting the mouse, if anyone can see that up there. And maybe that's entirely the appropriate location, but, you know, I think it's just worth exploring at least at a high level, what are the natural constraints and opportunities <coughs> on this property? I mean, I think looking at this map, it seems like there's probably limited ability for a future connection given, as you just said, with um, uh, with the stream sort of on the back side. But, you know, maybe it's worth looking at. But just really thinking about the connection with that remaining land. <coughs> Thanks. I'd like, to, I'd like to just go on record as agreeing with you on that. And if the stream... If the back part of it, where the stream is, impacts that, well, it, it'll be a wetland anyway, so it probably wouldn't be developable. Mm -hmm. Where, right? So. <clears throat> well, no, I'm thinking that having that, it, it really was not anything I would have thought of. But when you brought up the fact that there was another piece of land that's almost as big as this one, that was face is probably going to be developed. Interconnectivity seems to be really important to me, and I don't know. Complete streets doesn't come into this, does it? I mean, we're, we're trying not to have dead-end streets. So, Angela, I don't know if you want to touch on complete streets, but I, I think complete streets means different things in different contexts. Mm -hmm. and so, I'll let... I think it, I think any opportunity we have, we can look at complete streets. I mean, and that's what we just talked about. We talked about the sidewalk and where it's going. You talk mm -hmm. about street tree, all of that stuff. It becomes part of the complete street network. So, um, and that interconnection plays into it. So, just something to keep in mind. Because it's, it's one of the ways that that the town is trying to go in the direction of con connectivity. And, and I would also just add um, that we've seen many times that streams and brooks don't prohibit development across and <laughs> or even wetlands for that matter. So I guess I wouldn't discount any connection mm -hmm. on the other side either. Um, mm -hmm. It's probably less critical where that slides than what Jay's talking about the other side, because I think you're you're gonna you're gonna cross it no matter what. So that that line along that line doesn't seem as as critical to nail down as, as the other side that Jay pointed out. Yeah, I mean I I would, I would appreciate the effort of looking at that as well. I mean I know I know sometimes the the tough reality of it is there's sometimes a tension between what, what we want as planners and what 
maybe cells. Um, people tend to like to live at the end of dead end streets and cul de sacs. Um, I don't know whether that's a, you know something that the developer is thinking about, but um, I think there are, there's a lot to be said for connectivity in terms of um, just a neighborhood neighborhood feel as well as overall traffic movement and public safety and other factors. So I guess um, take take another look at that. I don't know if other board members have any other thoughts on that. All right. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Item number seven, Sun and Shine Realty LLC, Portland Volvo requests a sketch plan review for a new automobile dealership at 9 U.S. Route 1, Assessor's Map U50, Lot 18. Good again. Well, all right. All right. So as you said, uh, the applicant's in front of the board for a sketch plan uh, for a new building for the Portland Volvo dealership. Located at 9 U.S. Route 1 near the South Portland border. It is in the BOR zoning district, and uh, it is the only zoning district in town that allows for automobiles, sales, and service facilities, given they were in existence prior to 2007. Um, as you guys are well aware, um, typically automobile sales and repair businesses require uh, a contract zoning process through with town council and, and the planning board. So moving along to some of the issues, um, there, this zone does require a 25-foot buffer strip, including landscaping. That's required along any property with Route 1 frontage. Uh, parking lots should also be located to the rear and sides of the buildings per uh, zoning and design standards. Um, the, the applicant did provide an initial building design um, with this submission. And the building design will definitely be a big part of the review process, along with the site layout, um, including building materials and how the building interacts with the street. That's all I have right now. Thank you. Come on. I'll turn over to Mr. Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the board, my name is Sean Frank. I'm the host of Tonight is Dale Avery, a representative of the owners. Uh, we just thought this was an appropriate time to, uh, to bring this uh, project in front of the board. Obviously, we appreciate your feedback in terms of the, uh, the overall site layout we're talking about here, uh, as well as the building itself. Yes. Yeah. I'm better with this one. <laughs> uh, so just to get everyone oriented real quickly, it's the Portland Volvo site. I think we're all very familiar with it, obviously coming from uh, Route 1. Uh, southbound off of uh, South Portland. Uh, the first main building is approximately 15,000 square foot, single story building here now. Uh, it's been there for a while, we'll just over some additions over the last uh, 20 years or so. As part of that, uh, they've been adding on to obviously the, uh, the vehicle display area associated with that. Um, it's now at the time, obviously, when you have dealerships, uh, there's always <coughs> certain upgrades that have to go with the buildings associated with that. And uh, Bolton Wall has always been working with the applicant in terms of, uh, of their requirements. Uh, what we're proposing, if you will, is uh, to construct a new 25,000 plus or minus square foot building uh, in this location over here. Uh, and once if we have this up and running, uh, the existing facility would be uh, removed and in that area be utilized for, uh, for the additional display and parking area. Um, we have shown. Uh, you know, the driveway across the front of the building uh, with some display along the front. Uh, picking up on Janelle's uh, comment in terms of the 25 foot uh, buffer. Uh, the previous had required was 15 feet, uh, so we did have a 15 foot buffer along this edge. Uh, we would like to maintain that 15 feet. I don't know if that's possible uh, along that existing edge of pavement, if you will, and, uh, and propose a uh, the 25 foot along the front of the building in this area here. Again, something we would like to discuss with the board. Um, utilities obviously are all on site uh, associated with the existing facility and will be extended to service to the, uh, the new development. Uh, stormwater management is going to be a, obviously a crucial part of this whole thing uh, associated with the, how we're treating that. Uh, this does have a stormwater permit. Uh, I don't know, I don't think I knew that when we actually got together last time. 
Um, and we've all <coughs> modified that. It was actually an old TSS uh, uh, based uh, design. So we actually have a, a more technics unit in this location here, which will obviously be removed. Uh, so I don't think there may be some type of uh, you know, treatment facility we associated with the treatment of uh, wetland in the box, and being a box type of thing. Uh, perhaps a, a, a small uh, underground pond in this area here. As well as a retrofit of the existing pond within this area. So, again, here's the general site layout. Uh, one of the big aspects we had discussed with staff. Uh, there's currently uh, three driveways uh, servicing the facility. Uh, we're supposed to maintain two of them. We will close up. Uh, this once the building's actually constructed, we will close uh, this driveway down to the vehicle. We maintain the, uh, the two driveways in this location. We are main, proposing to maintain the existing locations of those driveways. Um, in the current event, you know, we just this one just recently reconstructed. Uh, so it's only our intent is to minimize any types of work uh, that we do on that as well. Uh, as Jamel stated, we have uh, an architect that has been on board. Again, uh, we're working through uh, the bubble dealership associated with, with their design requirements. Uh, their first proposal had been pretty much the same type of building, if you will, with a single story. Uh, we had come in and seen staff a little bit to discuss, you know, adding some types of features to the, to the, to the building. As part of that, uh, you know, uh, have worked in terms of providing, uh, you know, peaked roofs and some type of uh, roof dimensions associated with the proposed uh, facility out through here. Uh, this is uh, uh, metal panels, uh, aluminized up within the front, uh, the roof as well. Uh, obviously, uh, the proposed item what we look at is basically, oh, excuse me, we are looking at uh, perspectives. Building from uh, um, both sides of Route 1 uh, and just kind of giving an overall perspective of the building as we have it uh, looking. I think we'll have the, uh, the service area on one side uh, uh, the, uh, and the actual dealership, if you will, with the new vehicles and the display areas on the other side. Um, so, with that, Mr. Chairman, we are here at the sketch plan. Again, we thought it was important to get the boys in front of the road uh, to what the development proposal is at this point in time so we can. Uh, Move forward again through the design process as well as the town. So, uh, with that, I conclude my presentation. So, on behalf of Thank you. I appreciate the efficient overview. Um, Robin. Wow. Pick up. Yeah. Definitely appreciate the short and to the point, Sean. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned um, retrofitting the existing stormwater basin that's there, the, the one on the far right-hand side of the, of the site plan. You said that one was an old, like, said basin designed for TSS. I think this is really probably just like a small detention basin, if I okay. had to guess, really, yeah, right down if you on the corner. So okay. I thought it was an underdrain pond associated with that, perhaps, at least okay. providing treatment for that runoff and into there. And that actually picks up as a, 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 mm -hmm. a catch basin in the low spot right here, yeah. uh, which actually feeds down to here as well. So okay. we picked up, you know, that area as well as uh, that driveway area. So there's not going to be any, re is there going to be any regrading? Of the parking lots at all? Uh, yes, there will be. Okay. Yes, uh, specifically over associated with the with the new building. Okay, yes. so that sort of like auxiliary parking lot will probably remain as is then. To a certain degree, I've shown yeah. some additional parking, but I, I'm going to revisit that. To be honest with you, it almost okay. seems like we're doing a lot of work for very little. Game. Yeah, and I. Um, hmm. You're so you're so close to what is it the nun such back there? Uh, yeah, this is uh, this is the big culverts across under Route One right yeah. through here. Yeah. I don't know if this has a name. It's a trip. It comes down to yeah. Old Mill Pond. It's, yeah. Excuse me, damned. I, I think the dam is still pretty much there, and that does flow down to the nun such. Yes. Oh, uh, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, you're real. You're really hemmed in there as far as real estate is concerned, and what you can do for stormwater, huh? We are. Could yeah. you could you ever could you grade it toward the the grass so that you can get some, so well, it's not so centralized, Sean? They did have a wooded buffer here originally. That yeah. was part of the overall design was main. Yeah. And that'll be pretty much maintained. But okay. my thought is, is I don't think that'll meet today's standards. I because agree. Of the slope, to be perfectly yeah. honest with you. Just look at the topography we have here. Uh -huh. I think if I look at today's standards for yeah. what a wooded buffer requires in terms of again about the sheet flow going right. through the woods, uh, I'm just afraid that that's. 
even though it'll pretty much remain there, I'm just afraid we're not going to get much benefit of it from a natural stormwater treatment standpoint. Have you thought about underground storage or and, and anything like be, that? Yeah, we have, yes, and that may be something, you know, okay. that may be, we could maybe come just to shelter. Yeah, especially if, it, if you're taking out the Vortechnix unit but not necessarily replacing it with anything, you're just going to incorporate whatever the Vortechnix was doing into your overall design. Yes, and again, our thought was, and let's face it, what it's really doing is not much of anything at this point in time, but our <laughs> thought was certainly at least in terms of perhaps the roof, uh, in a, this low spot here in the back, I certainly see this driveway in the back coming to a low spot. You know, again, maybe uh, uh, we've had a lot of luck with those, you know, the, the, the wetlands, the, the tree in the box type thing yeah, associated with that. Yeah, sure. Now talk to me about the front. You said you wanted to try to keep it 15 feet instead of 25 feet. Well, we have existing pavement out on, so you know we were hoping not to get in. And like you say, in terms of the the grading, we're certainly going to be doing some out through here. We're trying to maintain as much of this pavement in this current configuration as we can. Uh, this is the edge of pavement out through here now. Uh, so we were hoping that we could maintain that line. Mm. Uh, again, we could certainly heavily <coughs> limit that. Again, I don't even know if that's an option. I certainly haven't mentioned it to staff. Or turn it into a rain garden? Oh. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's that's really all I had, Sean, was just to sort of test you on the stormwater. So you're looking good. And I, again, I, I understand stormwater is the key, but obviously, like you say, the site is pretty much graded as it yeah. is now, away from Route 1. So I think we will be limited to a certain degree in terms of some of the configuration. All right. Thank you for your, your short shortness. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Rachel. Yeah, I, I'm not that familiar with the site, Sean. What's on either side of it? Uh, there's a small road that goes down. It's a little dead-end road, so there's a few residential homes coming through here. And this, I believe, I think that's a hotel off the top of my head. That's a good question. Though. What else? This is actually in the same zone. I've shown that as R2, and that was a good point. It's, it's a redemption road. center. The redemption isn't, isn't that where the redemption center is? No, I think it's a little no, further down, down that's over the South Portland line. <laughs> in South Portland. Yeah, it's, it's, in, it's over the south, that's over the South Portland line. Yeah, I think. Yeah, it's not quite that close. Yeah, we're not quite there yet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, I think I was just concerned with the amount of buffering between the abutting sites. This has so, some nice buffering there now. It's actually mm -hmm. some pretty good uh, uh, evergreens associated with that, and so we'll continue that down in through there. Uh, you're right, what's here now is what is here, but this is, again, I, I you know, I, I get what was remiss, there was not a zone line there. The BOR zone actually does extend into that property as well. All right, the... Um, I'd be damned if I can make what's going on here on that property. Yeah, I guess I have... Okay, I... I have a concern about um, the amount of uh, buffering on the street on, on Route 1 and would like to see the, the full 25 feet there. And I, then, as I say that, I know that might provide a crunch in terms of vehicle display, another 10 feet taken up. But um, the thing about a car dealership is it, you have to have lots and lots of cars. At the same time, uh, all of that pavement uh, isn't isn't visually, I guess, in keeping of what we're trying of what we think of Scarborough in terms of parking areas with trees and with the divisions. Um, so I'm trying just trying to to think of how to break up some of that parking area, how to screen some of it. Um, I don't know enough to tell you what to do on that, but I think that uh, I would like to see that that screen and that buffering along Route 1. I appreciate that. I will just say, is, uh, again, obviously that's, again, I'm always in the balance of that. So the balance of that I'm always trying to do is, of course, my client wants to display vehicles and he wants people to be able to see little people going by. Uh, the client wants to have, uh, you know, uh, an aesthetically pleasing uh, visual as they ride along the road. And again, I don't think that they have to be mutually exclusive well, hopefully we can still actually see the facility and see the vehicle, but at the same time provide a nice property, if you will. If you will yeah, and I'd like to see something, if you can come up with something creative or imaginative that, that meets the, the interests of both of us, of the town and, and your client, I think, I think that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thanks. Rick? Um, how much of the, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, um, the all the parking area that there's now, all the pavement that there's now, is you you don't have a 
before and after shot of, I think you have it here. This is before and this is after, is that what I'm looking at? Uh, yes. So you're really only increasing the pavement very slightly. Correct. Over in the corner. Okay. The main point would be here and actually the middle on the back. Yeah. Okay. So it's essentially the same footprint. You're going to have something a bit more pavement associated with it, but uh, not a great deal. Again, the main right. point really was to get allow access along the rear of the building and we were kind of uh, squaring off the front. But, you know, now we're going to be sliding back, obviously, to a certain degree. Uh, yeah. So that front pavement, so you're right that last year. Okay. Yeah, I think um, with the pond being so close, stormwater is going to be your toughest challenge, but it always seems to be one of the toughest challenges, so I'm sure you will figure that out. All right. I don't Thanks. Nick? Yeah. Sure. I don't have a whole lot. Um, <coughs> But I do, I am curious about the, you're getting rid of one of the three drives. Is there a reason you wanted the two? Oops. Yeah, just from circulation, and obviously uh, the same type of thing is if, you know, uh, you're bringing in something to unload the vehicles and that type of thing, there might be some type of structure associated with it. What we really want to maintain is that, that main drive. Unimpeded, if you will, you know, for access to the service area and here, and to treat this, if you will, more as, you know, kind of like what we use on this board is in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the deliveries of the vehicles and those types of things to get in and out of uh, this area back and forth. It provides a good circulation route for us as well, uh, rather than just the, uh, try to maintain all that work uh, just off the one five. Okay. And then um, I, I agree that the uh, buffers, you know, you should keep in line with the buffers of the zoning. Um, I don't have a whole lot else to add on this. Uh, architecturally, you know, it's another another dealership. Uh, is what it looks like. And <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to argue the point with you, but it's really uh, I do think, like I said, I think they at least took the next step, if you will, to add something, at least in terms of the roof facade when we first came in. I mean, you know, I think Jay kind of just looked at it and said, uh, no. Because uh, it was built basically a single story flat roof structure, right? You know, that whole thing really is obviously the, the, uh, the facade and the, uh, the window glazing associated with that. So uh, I, I, I'm hopeful at least that the board will appreciate the fact that they did go that next step, if you will, to at least add, you know, some type of roof uh, geometry associated with this and try to you know, provide some type of kind Hopefully, instead of just no, I pointed out the uh, standards <laughs> of the town and the, how those were to be applied. No, no, it, 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 they always those standards. So. Sean's trying to be very economical with yes, his words. That's, that's probably what it sounded like, but. <laughs> Jay always relies specifically upon the ordinance, I will say that. I think outside of that, I'm, I'm all set at this point. Thank Thanks. Susan. First, um, I think if you're looking at the Volvo service now, and you go north towards South Portland, there's a bunch of manufactured housing in there. Correct. The oh. entrance is off South Portland, but yes. they're actually in Scarborough. So on that's the other side, right? You would actually have it on the other side of that middle pond, if you will. There you go, because yes. we, we couldn't figure out what was down there. Well, that's, it's, that's it's, it. it's, it's, No, I think it's the next one, right? I don't... It is the it's that building right there, Susan, to be honest with you. I'm not quite sure what that is. I don't think that's part of, I don't think it's part of the manufacturing house. So. She's, she's got an art of her own. Uh, driving. She's, she's driving. She's driving. It looks like a house. I think it's a little house. <laughs> 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 okay, never mind. <laughs> the On the other side, it's, it's a motel. It's beyond yeah. it. Yeah. You're beyond yeah. it. Okay, yeah. on the other side is a dirt road. Correct. Anyway, um, I don't have any <laughs> problems with flipping it like that. In fact, I think I'd like it better. Um, I would like to suggest that there are ways, I am not educated on them, but there are ways that you can have really nice landscaping and see cars. Mm -hmm. So I would like to see um, islands, landscaping islands in, the cars are going to be coming together, like th these islands, the cars are going to be facing each other, supposedly. Yes. Something that goes down the middle that creates like a, a walkway for trees. 
I would stick to that Route 1 frontage we were talking about, Susan. Uh, I the think Interior the Island from a, a car dealership, as you can imagine. I mean, it, again, it's not like uh, an office building or something else where, you know, uh, everyone leaves at the end of the night so you can go and you can follow This is and, This is an entrance into Scarborough. It certainly is. It is a gateway into Scarborough. Hmm? Yes, it's a gateway into Scarborough. And I think that some kind of an attempt can be made to do some kind of landscaping in that great big sea of cars. Now on the other side, where the cars now sit, it's interesting because if I remember, I haven't been out there in a while, but the land kind of slopes, doesn't it, from Route 1 down? Yes. Which actually helps in terms of buffering the, land, the uh, parking. And if the landscaping along Route 1 had been a little more creative, it would be really quite nice. It's, it's, it's in the right, it's heading in the right direction. But this side of it is going to be flat. It's not going to have that advantage of it going down. So it's going to be quite a create, some kind, something can be done. I know it can be done, and I'm not going to try to do it tonight. <laughs> but, um, I, I'm taken with the phrase um, streetscape. This building, the new building, is it closer to Route 1 than the other building was? I can't tell whether. Slightly, yes. Slightly. Yes. Okay. And it can't be, if the architecture as you've shown it is, has nothing to do with being a streetscape, it's just a big square building, all white, with, with um, I, I can't tell what's going on there, but it, not much. Are there any windows? Are there uh, any windows? The it's on the display windows. What am I looking at? A display, 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 and then regular windows off to the side on the other side of the working side. So looking at it, we have display windows, display okay. windows. This is the canopy we're looking at here in the corner, again with the windows, and then going down the side again. That's kind of the the, the working side is is. Uh, you know, more the, uh, the okay. office windows. I think the right. reason I'm getting confused is that I can't, all right, I, I'm looking at this sheet here, okay, where it's got one, two, three, four. You don't have it up there. I'm not sure that I don't. Okay. I do think if you're looking at, uh, the top, the top uh, one. you know, the, uh, the property, uh, they have their front, east front elevation. Okay, the, the, top, the top drawing yes. is from Route 1, am I correct? That's correct, yes. Okay. And to the far right of that are service bays. That's correct. And then there's this big Volvo sign. And are those windows that are underneath the Volvo sign? Yes, they are. They are. Okay, and then on the, I don't see, what, what is that? Anyway, if I go further to the left, there are windows, I don't know, I, I can't tell what is windows and what is architectural detail. Uh, there's, a, there's a doorway there. I there's can, a doorway with, with glass. Yeah, and, and then, then to the left of that. And further up uh, underneath the Portland, if you're looking at it, there's uh, glass underneath there as well. So between the door and where it says Portland, what's that? Between the door and where it says Portland, that's, that's the, the, the metal whole, panels. That's what? The metal panels. It's metal panels. Yes. Okay. And up above is metal panels? That's correct. Yes. Okay, this, is, this is when you get to the point of showing us materials. <coughs> this is going to be broken up somehow. That's one great Yes, yes. Yeah, and again, I think in terms of, I mean, you're looking at it right now on that top sheet as one, and that's the whole point of the, you know, that's the confusing part sometimes of the elevations. It all shows it as one line, if you will. I think that's in terms of the site plan. And in terms of the perspective, what's trying to show it is that okay. there is depth. I'm not going to make a big deal of it now, but one of the problems that I have as a board member is indeed getting a really good sense of perspective. And I could give you three or four examples of where I thought I got it, but it really wasn't what I thought I was going to get at all. So somehow or another, this is going to be made a little clearer in terms of what is actually happening. 
to improve that building. I understand it's got a little bump out, but I'm looking at, you know, how do the materials work with each other? Is it just one big cut? You know what I'm talking about? Susan, they'll certainly have an architect. The architect, we have, they have architects who came on board, and so they're not an architect. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't always trust them. Okay. <laughs> if you're looking at the front, from the front again, to the, um, the little thingy parking area that's up to the right. Yes. Okay. What are those little things that are sticking out? There's a canopy over there. There's a so canopy. Have, again, if you look at it, when I say cover, it's a covered canopy for the display vehicle right here. Is that what that is up above? Here. So it sounds like we need some better detailed architecturals for next time. Yeah. And some and some material samples. Oh, I'm sorry, those are that show right here. Right. I thought we were still on the building plan. Yep. This was, uh, and I think Robin and I talked about this, this is where I was trying to gain a few more spaces, but I'm thinking that maybe, you know, we yeah. may be doing a lot of work for not an awful lot of gain, so I will the, take a hard look at that. Yes, I was showing some additional spaces up there in that part. What, what okay. I think you're seeing there, Susan, is existing parking and proposed parking sort of all overlaid, so. <laughs> no wonder I'm a little confused, yeah, a little right? Confusing. Okay. Um, I love the idea of rain gardens, yes. Um, I would I would really like to have a 15 foot buffer, but I'll trade it for rain garden. <laughs> what is that thing on the front where the um, between the two entrances? It's got a little square box. That's the existing sign. It's a sign. Yes. Ah, of course it is. It's signage. Mm, right, and you're going to try to keep the same signage, if I remember. Yes, yeah, that's okay. And I, um, I really so appreciate the fact that we're going to try to do something a little creative with the with the um, wastewater, not wastewater, but you know, stormwater management. I don't know anything about it, but of course, <laughs> I don't have to. <laughs> Oh, I will set up. I'm, I, I have a project manager from DEP now assigned, yes. and as soon as I have a pre-construction, I mean a, a pre-application meeting, I will certainly okay. invite Angela to join us if, if that happens. No. Andrea, okay. can, can I just? Um, she was actually pointing to not the sign. She was pointing on the other side of the driveway. <laughs> there's uh, a con there's like con looks like concrete or something in a, in a clear box. It's like a kitchen sink. Not between the two driveways on the other side, in front of the building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, those are those are some vehicle display areas. It's some room with concrete and really? yes. <laughs> vehicle <laughs> display areas. Yes. <laughs> well landscaped, I hope. Well, uh, obviously, yes. I think that this really, you know, I'm, I'm joking about it, but this really is where the tension comes with a, with a um, automobile dealer. Of course they want us to see the cars. But on the other hand, they're sitting right on Route 1. And this is an entrance, a, a, a major entrance into Scarborough. I don't think it's necessary to have a car sitting there, you know, 15 feet away from the freaking road. Show us how it can look attractive and I'll change my mind. Um, this is an opportunity to do something a little more creative because we're starting with a whole new building and not that I don't think the old building was okay, but you know, okay, we do better than okay. Um, I don't know, I'll just look forward to seeing what comes up next. And I'm all about design and I really do think that without going into a great deal of detail, there is something that can be done to see how you can put some landscaping in a parking area where there are cars. <coughs> Please do. I appreciate your willingness to try. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, some of this, including the landscaping, has been kind of a recurring theme. I don't know what kind of an economic indicator it is that we seem to be having every dealership either redeveloping or mm -hmm. locating in Scarborough right now. But we had a similar conversation around landscaping at another Gateway into Scarborough the other night, discussing first stage of a possible contract zone for another dealership, um, and I just echo uh, what Susan and others have said that you know we we totally get that your client wants wants people to be able to see the product and it is a dealership, uh, but um, we just look for some creative landscaping and some you know some different approaches to respect that. Um, 
and I'd, I'd like to try to see the 25 foot buffer if, if, if that can be incorporated given, given the other constraints. I um, appreciate the responsiveness to the feedback on the design, particularly understanding that as with any kind of uh, you know, franchise, if you will, of a national brand, there are certain preferences and standards and kind of out of the box designs that are probably the path of least resistance from their perspective. So we appreciate that responsiveness to our, our standards and our, uh, our preferences. Um, one quick question, Can you just confirm that in terms of the, it looks like it, but in terms of the internal circulation that you'll be able to get the big uh, uh, car carrier trailers into, and all the way into the yes, site. And again, yeah. I know Janelle, one of his comments was, yeah. well, was to just show the 24 yeah. ladder track, right. which of course works out well for us okay. from, a, from a carrier as well. So right. we will provide that to make sure the vehicle can get around. Okay, great. You'll be doing the auto turn simulation, obviously. Yes. Um, and, uh, Buffering stormwater has been been well discussed, so I think that's all we have for you. Do you need anything, anything else from us at this no, point I for sketch? Uh, again, that was our whole point of obviously coming to see you folks. Certainly, if you missed appreciate us. the feedback. And, uh, you missed us. And I didn't. <laughs> <excuse me. laughs> all right. Thank you. 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 Um, so we're going to move on. I want to be very upfront. Uh, we're going to get to one more item tonight, and that's the next item, number eight on the agenda. We can't take anything up, anything new up after 10:30. I do apologize to those we're not going to get to tonight. Um, appreciate your patience and understanding, and we'll get you right into the queue for the next agenda. Um, that said, number eight is uh, Black Point Holdings LLC requests a site plan review for a new multi-tenant building at 20 Black Point Road, Assessor's Map U43. Lot 11. Which one of you will be introducing this one? I think uh, we have Jamel teed up to kick All right. this one off for us. Ready? Take yeah, it away. Ready. All right, just in time. Um, so, like you said, it's a site plan review for 20 Black Point Road, or at 20 Black Point Road. It is in the TBC 2 district, and uh, these folks are back in front of the board for a third meeting. At the last meeting, uh, there were three primary issues that were discussed uh, traffic and site access buffering from neighboring properties and the overall stormwater approach on the site. Uh, it's, the board seemed generally comfortable with traffic and site access at the last meeting, um, so we won't, I won't touch on that today. But as a result of the public and board's feedback at the last meeting, the applicant has eliminated six parking spaces in the easterly parking field and has replaced those spaces with additional plantings. Um, to provide more buffering to the neighboring properties. Uh, the applicant did resubmit a revised set of plans on Friday afternoon, um, but staff and the board hasn't had a chance to review these materials. Uh, so now I'll turn it over to Angela for her comments on stormwater. Thanks. As Jamel said, obviously six spaces being gone um, makes an impact on the overall impervious surface on the site. Um, however, there wasn't really any additional, I guess, information for stormwater management report, any update with that. Obviously, any decrease is a bonus and um, will decrease the flow off the site, as we talked about. Adding the buffer and trees and vegetation is only going to help with that process. But um, it left a, a pretty odd layout and configuration, which staff had comments about, um, and how that, would, uh, how that would function in the winter months. And again, like Jamel had stated, um, I'm sure probably in that packet there's some conversation about addressing those concerns and the layout that's left of the stormwater management system. It's kind of like a, a remnant of what used to be there. Um, and so having a basin off the pavement now or was connected by a strip of pavement was just, a, um, it, we had concerns about it functioning actually when you're pushing snow up off the parking lot and things like that. So. Again, have not had time to look at any updated stormwater um, layout, so um, I can probably speak to what was submitted, but um, other than that, I can chime in as needed with questions. Okay. Thank you. Rocky. Good evening. Uh, Rocky Vitsbera here representing uh, Black Point Holdings. Uh, Nancy St. Clair prepared uh, some nice answers to all of the staff comments. 
suppose that the exam will go down to every one, but I'm not sure that we really need to um, at this point. I felt like we were pretty close at the last meeting uh, and, and satisfied most of the board's requirements and, and questions, uh, specifically about traffic. And, and at that meeting, we talked about the previous area and, and had some back and forth on uh, you know, what could happen uh, if we eliminated those six parking spots. So, in fact, we did, had, uh, Nancy did modify the plans. They came back to the town uh, with modifications, but it was Friday and, and Angela hasn't had the time to, to, to reassess those. But basically, I feel like it's something that if the board wanted to give approval tonight, that, that Angela could maybe sign off on it in the end. We come up with a you know, way to answer questions, but for the board's purposes, we changed nothing about the, the storm drainage system from the plans that you've seen and, and from what's been reviewed by the town. All we did was eliminate the six parking spaces. And uh, in, in order to answer uh, Angela's concerns uh, from last, last week, um, we added one catch basin so that the, the storm drainage system still will be sized for and could handle the water as if those six additional spaces were there. Uh, we've just come up with a way to, to, to make it easy and, and, uh, and to handle that. So I think that uh, you know, we can work, that's something we can work through with the staff and we really felt that way. Um, just kind of hitting on the high points, I think that's that's probably the big drainage one. Um, I have Keith Smith here, again, we can kind of talk about the, the landscaping and, and I can have him give you a presentation on that if you, if you wish to hear it. Uh, but basically, in a nutshell, uh, by eliminating those six spaces, we were able to add some landscaping and pull some landscaping up the hill so that it's going to give a better buffer area uh, for, the, for the neighbors. In addition to that, in re-looking at the, um, now without those spaces and re-looking at the lighting, we were able to shift uh, some lights around a little bit and it's got a detailed plan you know, that shows it, but it allowed us to eliminate one pole light in, in the parking lot. So it, it, Again, yeah, pull the pull the light pole back, and you can get into details if you'd like to hear it. But, uh, so that was that was an important uh, issue and, and a good benefit to the compromise we talked about. Um, one of the other things that the staff had on the comments, I think we should should touch on. Uh, David Pio from Gowan Turgeon was here and uh, has talked about the building, and I think the board is generally sure satisfied with the building. We do have some samples, but it's tonight if you're interested to see. Uh, what, what those might look like, but basically what we're looking at is a, is a white on white uh, siding finishes with uh, gray stone uh, accents and a, a basically a black roof. The roof will be uh, an asphalt shingle, but it'll be an architectural style shingle, so it'll be a, a nice looking uh, high quality black. Uh, the color is actually called moray black, which is a kind of two tone black, so it's not like a, a deep, really dark black. It's kind of a nice, uh, it's got a nice to it. Um, again, I think we satisfied the traffic issues. The staff had brought up, um, one of the things that in regard to the traffic issues, the staff had brought up uh, a note uh, to put on the plan regarding uh, medical use. Uh, and Nancy actually, we, we talked about this quite a bit, and, and Nancy has come up with a, with a thought on that. We're concerned about, if, if there's just a note on the plan that says the Ten, it must be a medical use that that's going to be a little bit cumbersome. And I think that uh, what would rather see that, that note say uh, is basically that if, if the use that we propose to put in there would generate more trips than what Bill has calculated in his, his trip generation report, then we would have to come back to the board. That would just save a, a step. Uh, in, in general, I think it's probably going to be a medical type use that, that we come up with. Uh, for, for the uh, end user, but I think that, that we should talk about that, uh, that note to be added to the plan of uh, the board's uh, I'm not sure if I've covered everything, but I think I've the high points. Uh, you have to some questions. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I think we'll, we'll see what questions are still out there and can get into more detail in certain areas as needed. Um, I do want to give the opportunity for public comment if there is anyone here who is interested. All right, okay. Um, so, put it up for grabs. Who wants to go first? <laughs> Rachel. All right. Um, Rocky, uh, thank you for 
accommodating us with those six spaces. Um, one of the things that I had asked about was uh, the ability to do some, some sort of striping so that we don't have as much of a dead end to it on the side of the building that cars can actually turn around or find a place to turn around. Um, and I don't see that. Is that on the plans or? We, we actually talked about that amongst ourselves and, and I thought when you were talking about that specifically, we were talking about the, the larger parking lot that would be uh, on the Route 1 side of the building, if you will. And I thought that you know we've got a couple of places there that are all striped out that part of the handicapped parking that someone could back into. I mean, we could add one more striped off area, it would, be, it would be the loss of no space to us. Um, that's, that's something that we could add. Um, yeah, I, I, and I, I note that you did that on the, on the larger area, but we still have the potential for people uh, backing up at least seven spaces. Um, well, again, we could, you know, we could strike one off. Uh, it's, it's a loss of another space. I think it's pretty common to see this type of parking lot at you know, that, that type of depth. Um, <coughs> Well, I'd defer to uh, to Jay or Jamel as to whether it's common not to stripe off at that size. Uh, this is a fairly standard um, situation that we see at dead ends with the sort of smaller hammerhead at the end. Though, you know, I don't know that it's ever been truthed out, so to speak. But um, we, I certainly have seen this design in in the years. Um, I don't know if anyone else have any, any thoughts on it. But. All right, I'll let that go. Thank you. Thanks. Anyone else? Any comments? Yes. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> it sounds like we need to work out some of the wording for the abutter. You don't, you know, you don't want to necessarily pin the 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 chiropractic center into having a, a medical abutter kind of a thing. Um, so it sounds like we need to still work that out. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily agree that nothing's changed with respect to stormwater. Can you, can you tell me, can you assure us that the post construction flows are equal to or less than the pre construction flows? Because last time, I was here when you guys were in front of us. There was real concern about off-site impacts to the condo association and some others behind Rocky. So unless, you know, and yeah, so. So at that point in time, we met all the criteria for the, for the we met all the tax criteria. So Nancy has not changed any of the, you know, any of the ponds, any of, any of the storm rate system in, in backing back this, these six spaces. And, and I'm not sure that I agree with that because you added a catch basin. So you actually may have impacted some of the stormwater to some of the study points. So, and the point I'm getting at too is that if it was just given to staff on Friday, I don't necessarily feel like we're at a point to, to move forward with a motion, I guess. I, I want to give staff the opportunity to weigh in. change, all this grading didn't change, this pond didn't change, none of that changed from the last meeting. We just added catch basin right there, catch that water. I think the, the plans that were sent in earlier uh, in response to the, to the uh, staff's comments showed, uh, I think if you look at your plan, it shows a little paved area down to this basin. 
and you know staff comments were that that probably wasn't such a great idea uh, because of winter conditions and, and we agreed and thought you know a better way to do it would be just to have that basin so that it would be right in the corner and uh, catch the water off the parking lot leave this one catching the water that might be there uh, so it's pretty pretty straightforward pretty simple You all set, Rob? I think At so. least in terms of. For now. Yeah. Any more comments? Okay. Um, I honestly don't see a lot of changes other than than the last time, so I don't have any. I asked my questions last time. I don't really see. Other than taking out the six spaces and making less of pervious service, I don't see anything different than what I saw last time, and I was okay with it last time, so I'm still okay with it. <laughs> Thanks. Nick? Yeah, I think I'm in the same boat. Uh, We've reviewed this a few times now, and I think um, I'm glad the applicant was able to reduce the number of parking spaces, which was something that we had asked for at the last meeting. Um, <clears throat> I would say that um, as far as the proposed language that uh, I guess Nancy and the applicant had come up with, um, can you go over for me how you, um, that trip generation, is it is there like a Bible of types of businesses that have a trip generation count, or yes. is it, if you had, there is, okay. Exactly, and, and Nancy's proposed some language here, it's about three sentences, and I can, I can read it before if you're interested in knowing, but. Um, but it's pretty standard, right? So if, if you have a dentist office, it, so it could be a tattoo parlor. <coughs> if it generated the same amount of trips as the dentist office, it could be a tattoo parlor, correct? I don't have a problem with tattoo box. I'm just saying. It's, it, 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 but there is something that shows you exactly. Okay. You tie the traps, and I think that that's primarily what Yeah, yeah. That, no, I'm just, I'm just clarifying. So we wouldn't see it again unless it exceeded the amount of trip approvals that this is generating under a dental medical office use. Okay. I'm good. Angela, do you have something? Um, I guess I'm curious about the language just because there are uh, at least 10 editions of the ITE manual that has slightly different numbers associated with it. So for staff clarification to know what, what I guess to be, speci be specific in what you are noting in, so that we know what, what trips we're, we're working against. Mm -hmm. Whereas, mm -hmm. I think that would be important too. Yeah. To know what the, that trip threshold you're, you're trying to, to make sure we're under. So, if you don't mind, if I could just read about two, three, there's four sentences here. Sure. Yeah. Nancy proposed that the note actually say the leasable area for this project must consist of a traffic generator that is no greater than a medical dental office use as identified in the project's traffic impact study, period. Any tenant use that proposes an increase in trip generation beyond the equivalent of a medical dental office use occupy the lease space shall require review and approval of the money. Period. I have a quick follow-up to that. It, is the larger medical building would generate more trips, right? So is that a tie to a square footage or uh, number of doctors? Is there is there a yeah. how, how's that tied together? So it would be tied to usable leasable spaces in the building. Okay. So based on square footage. Okay. okay. So clarification. There's material that we haven't seen yet. So they're going to be coming back. Well I think that's a question. Well for that's the board. why I'm asking because there are things in here that we haven't touched on. Now for example, I really do want to see the materials. And if, if they're here, you can show me sure. what those are. Um, staff seems to be pretty consistent about the fact that we need to be very clear that the park, that the number of parking stalls, is not too intense for the site. Yes. I mean, this is what you wrote. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not making this up. Our the question for the planning yeah. board is whether or not the uses proposed for the building, which necessitates this, the number of parking stalls, is too intense for the site. That's a pretty big question. And um, I don't see that we've come even close to taking that on. I mean, we've budged up against it a couple of times, but 
it still is an open question. So I don't know what to do about the fact that it's an open question, that we can't even right. really create. Well, I was not at the last meeting, but my impression of it was that there actually was a fair amount of discussion about it, and the, the board generally got to the point where they were reasonably comfortable given a well, couple of the modifications that were, that were made. I know, I mean, I, I think staff, I interpret that as staff sort of reminding the board what that sort of threshold is and what that discretion is, but. It says there's a question. I'm sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to beat this, but right. I'm, I'm confused because I thought from the beginning that there was too much parking for this particular spot, but if it's been decided, then I'll just cross that whole line out and forget about it. If I may, because I chaired the last meeting, there was an extensive amount of time discussing parking, which yeah. is how we arrived at the request for them to reduce the number of parking spots by six. So if my that. memory serves me, I believe it was Rachel's suggestion, and I yeah. I agreed, I think. I agreed as well. That as well. The, um, I was, yeah. It was pretty clear, I believe, to the applicant that so was. Can just come out. I think that was the board's desire, and I think that was communicated during the last Okay. And if I might, I think staff just echoing that because we hadn't actually seen the app loop, the proposal. It was sort of a, okay, we're talking about this generally, it sounds good, so we wanted to be sure the board, now that you have an actual paper document in front of you that's articulated what was generally talked about, just reaffirm the board's comfort level. So um, I think that's really the, unless Jamel, Angela, you have a different... You know, different element to my recollection is the same as Nick's. We agreed that if the six were eliminated, it would be okay. But I think to Susan's point, too, we, there are things we haven't seen, like architecture, and I, that, that was my point about allowing staff time to respond to the comments that were only received had, on Friday. Samples here. Oh, okay. Jeremy, I have a question about the last meeting we encountered. And, and came away with the thought of that the board was satisfied if we got rid of six spaces that that, that, that met the need. Um, as far as the architecture, Theodore Peel has been here, uh, she's been here, I think, for three meetings. I think she's actually spoke for two, in two meetings, presented the architecture. Now, what we didn't tell you, the, the only thing that I can think of that we didn't tell you is that at those two meetings, well, what color the building is going to be. I'm prepared to show that to you tonight if you'd like to see it. But the building itself, the architecture of the building, I, I believe we've shown that to you that's been submitted for a couple of rounds. Um, and so I, I feel like the board had, had bought into what we've done for the building and we're satisfied with that. Again, we're going to talk about the colors. Um, as far as the, the plot plan itself, the site plan itself, when we submitted uh, a site plan with six spaces taken off, in time to get on to this meeting. And so the staff did get that. They didn't like the way we did the, the catch basin in the corner of that. And so Nancy quickly responded, thinking that the board might, and the staff might get a chance Friday to see it. But um, you know, that's, that's in an effort to, to address the staff comments, comments again. So you know, I, I feel like we've, we've responded to quite a few of these things. So, I, 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 generally share that understanding. I, I guess, and if I could, to me, the, the biggest question, and others can certainly chime in, to me, the biggest question uh, that will determine whether we're prepared to entertain a motion tonight is around the comfort level of, of having staff review the stormwater plan that was submitted on Friday as a, as a condition. And that's, you know, and, that, and that's at a couple of levels. One is the extent to which the board is comfortable with that based on what we know about everything else. And not to put them on the spot, I always hate to do this, but um, whether that is something that is within the sort of reasonable realm of what staff would typically be expected to review as a condition of approval. Um, <laughs> my sense is it's kind of pushing up against it a little bit. Um, and I, I'm always, I, I certainly understand, I always understand applicants' desire to always be pushing timing-wise, but. I guess I'll, I'll chime in for the stormwater review. I think, I think I've said since sketch plan, this is a pretty simple site. 
that stormwater system is pretty complicated for some reason. And so that's where we've gotten into more of the details. And so this has become a bigger issue about stormwater than probably it needs to be. And then also last meeting, we heard a lot from the abutters. And um, I think it would be helpful for me um, to do a, a further review and to work back and forth with the applicant is, I don't know as last time, and, and maybe Nick could clarify, should be the chair, was, we got back to the conversation of, are we only trying to get to pre-development peak flows? And that I can definitely review and we can go through and say, yep, this is the system and we can tweak it and we can get there. The, the question was, is it an adverse impact to the abutting properties, which is a totally different conversation, which is an opinion that the board needs to clearly state, because I cannot do that. And this, if I might, Angela, this, is, this sort of gets to the question between sort of peak flows and total volumes. Right. And, and that's really where we talked quite a bit around last meeting that, yep, you can control the peak flows, so the rate that's coming off, it never exceeds whatever that current rate is now, but as is stated, you know, volumes are always going to increase. That rate's going to be a longer duration. And, and then that's why maybe, um, maybe that was answered last time by the elimination of the six spaces. If the board is comfortable with, okay, they're reducing some of the volume because they reduced some of the impervious, then that would give me direction to say, okay, as long as they're meeting pre-development. But I, I need to, is that what the board is saying? I, I, I need some clarification. <laughs> Please. So, uh, yeah, the, my impression, and I'm, I think only Rachel and Rick will be the three there, and then um, what, who was fourth? Because Robin, you weren't there. Oh, Susan, Susan. Roger. 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 Roger was here. So there's three of us for it. And so you two are going to have to help me with the way I left that impression of that meeting when they walked away from <coughs> this was. The, the really big outstanding request was remove the six spots, beef up your landscaping a little bit, and I, I think that was it. I mean, as far as my understanding of the stormwater discussion was, I think the town had already said, Angela, you had so eloquently said, you, you've, met the, you've met the threshold to pre-existing conditions. You've met that. But there will be an increase in volume. Mm -hmm. All right, that was to be under, the elimination of that, those six spaces we thought we're going to help not only alleviate some of those volume concerns, but the neighbor's concerns because less uh, impervious surface and an additional buffer. Um, and they have an, a stormwater treatment system that is, like you said, more complex than what is probably necessary on the site. Mm -hmm. Not necessary. That's, and, and again, that's, this is where. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's my understanding from the that's, meeting. That was my understanding from the meeting. Yes. And Rick, do you? It's my agree? recollection as well. And so. we talked about. Oh, that's loud. <laughs> you know, we talked about peak flows and how they had to meet pre-development peak flows. And Angela educated me as to how that all works. Um, as far as the volume goes, I'm I'm sure it's something we should be concerned about because they have neighbors. But my point last week or last month, was that, that something's going in there anyway. And, you know, that spot's not going to be vacant right there on that corner. So something's going in there anyway. And it, it he eliminated the six spaces. Um, as far as the total impervious area and, and things like that, you, you put a pet store in there or a, or a Dairy Queen or something, and you're still going to have pavement. So, you know, if they meet the peak flows, and I think, though, what Corey said is valid. Angela should have, you know, if we were to move with a motion to, tonight, we should still have, Angela should still reserve the right <laughs> to veto the motion. I mm -hmm. totally agree yep. with that. Right. <laughs> yep. But and my recollection is the same as Nick's, and Nick and I and Rachel would, I think we all concur that that's what we talked about last week. And I think they left with the impression that, well, last month, they left with the impression that if they eliminated the six spaces, that would alleviate our stormwater concerns. Now, we can change it again now, but I don't think that's fair or makes sense. Yeah, I, and if I'm sorry. Don't, uh, don't apologize. I, and, I, and I feel like this is kind of a, a rehash of 
what we really spent, I, I want to say it was over an hour oh my on, yeah. if not two hours, on the one project on one meeting. And this is the, what, third or fourth time, Rocky, this has been here? Fourth? So the fourth time we've been here, and I am completely considerate of the fact that staff here has, you know, you need some guidance and things like that, but you guys are very capable, and I'll say it right out. Like, I full faith in you guys, and if there was ever a problem, I know you guys would bring it to us. So to see for a fifth time over something that we've discussed over many hours, I think I, I have reservations about. I'm personally prepared to make a motion to advance it tonight based on our feedback from the last meeting and what I've seen here. But that, you know, again, if staff says they are extremely uncomfortable, then I would, I would, I would sit here and, and reserve that. As I, as I typically say, staff will always act at the direction of the board, um, and so we'll, we did, we do have a draft motion. We weren't sure where the board was going to get tonight, so we'll can hand I that see, around so you can read that. Can and we I see will, the materials? The signing. Yes. Oh, the, the building materials. <laughs> can we, yeah. I just want to sort of put out there that you know staff is prepared. Whichever direction the board chooses to go, we can support. We will. <coughs> Uh, Rocky, would you mind, or one of you mind walking the materials around for us to see? All right. <laughs> well, I'm glad I waited. <laughs> that is so exciting. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to put that right there. It's worth waiting for. Uh, Somebody want to touch the material? <laughs> no, I don't want to touch that. Sometimes people do. It's dirty. It's dirty. <laughs> okay. So the building is primarily white on white, white trim, white siding. Uh, there are areas, uh, I think we, we've got a rendering. Does anyone have any comments or questions about architecture or materials? Rocky, which is the, um, the roof? The roof is uh, Which? That one, okay. Thank you. So thank you, thank everyone for the discussion. And Nick, I particularly appreciate the, Nick and others who were at the last meeting, I appreciate the 
the uh, institutional memory. Nick on that. did a great job of chair, by the way. Yeah, so I hear. Yeah. I'm just saying. It's, it's getting hot. All right. At 10.28, he said we're about done. Yeah. <laughs> um, so given, given everything that, that Nick described and that, and that we, we all discussed, um, I'm certainly comfortable putting forward a conditional uh, approval motion uh, with findings. I and mean, you all have that in front of you. And um, take a moment, if you haven't already, to skim over that. The findings are fairly pro forma. Um, but so it's important cool. on something like this to make sure that those are, those are articulated in, into the record. Uh, did someone have a question? Yeah, sorry. Yep. So under conditions, we'd have um, a condition, condition that said prior to issuing a building permit, staff shall review, review and approve existing storm, revised stormwater plan. Number yes, seven. I believe that's... Uh, uh, seven there? Number well, seven has a requirement for the engineer. <coughs> and then the condition that's is actually one E. One E is the actual condition. So uh, seven is a, is a finding. Yeah. Sort of a couple of those together. Yes. And then um, the... 1A, 1A um, can be, I think, wordsmithed and, and fleshed out to address the, the uh, proposed, address and incorporate some version of the proposed language that Nancy St. Clair proposed um, regarding potential changes of use from medical office. Um, and you could just change any change in use that generates more trips than designated in in, in original study. Yeah, at this point, I sort of thought maybe a plan note that specify any change in use um, that differs from the approved traffic report will require plan planning board approval. <laughs> I, I don't know if Angela wanted the specific number of trips in there because there's so many different versions of the. Yeah, and I, I think what we can do is if, if, if this condition, if the board's comfortable with this condition, we can work with the applicant on what the actual note on the plan says. We can work Smith. I think we can work off Nancy's more, you know, couple sentences <laughs> and, and sort of work on that. I agree. I think it might be worth actually locking in what that is because because trips, as she said, I think we're up to the ITE 10th manual and who knows when the 11th will come. So if we hammer a number, then... It's easy. And then I'm thinking just after you read all these, plans to review and approve five plans and staff. All right. On that note, I move to approve the project titled Scarborough Family Chiropractic, proposed by Black Point Holdings LLC, as depicted on the plan set, prepared by St. Clair Associates, dated February 26, 2018, with the following findings, waivers, and conditions. Findings, as stated herein. Uh, one waiver, given the adequate landscaping <coughs> provided on the proposed island, located between the two parking fields and throughout the site, the waiver requests for section four dot D dot B in the site plan review ordinance is approved. Conditions, number one, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the plan set shall be revised to include A, a plan note that specifies any change in use from, Oops, from sorry, <laughs> from uh, that, 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 uh, that scratch from, that differs. That differs so, from the approved traffic report. <laughs> <laughs> will require planning board approval. B, a plan note for the contractor to confirm that the landscape plan shall be coordinated with the grading and utility plan. C, a plan note that indicates that any additional signage proposed for the building, i.e. for the tenants, will need to be reviewed and approved by the planning department. D, provide an update and plan notation related to the proposed timing of the parking lot light fixtures. E, revise the stormwater management plans and details for the staff comments memo dated March 12, 2018. Plans to be reviewed and approved by planning department staff. Condition number two, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall submit payment of the traffic impact fees of $39,124.78.
Number three, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the applicant shall work with the fire department to ensure a location for a knock bo Knox box exterior access key box is provided. Number four, prior to the issuance of a building permit, the proposed signage plan shall be reviewed and approved by planning department staff. And condition number five, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor and is to be coordinated through the planning department. That is the motion. Second. Second, any further discussion? Uh, yes. Um, I, the plans that you've, uh, plan set that you've noted here was dated 22618, and I think we were just told that a new one has been made available. Mm -hmm. So should we have a different date? Uh, at this point, we haven't reviewed those plans. So, exactly. what what the next what that first condition talks about in terms of revising the plans will become the plan set of record. Um, so, at this point, I think I would leave it at the date that the board has had uh, in your in your files for your review. Um, and then, again, if you're comfortable with what with staff reviewing it, which sounds like you are, then we'll get that the. Okay. Sure. Anything else? Any other discussion? I don't feel like we've given Angela adequate direction as to whether or not it's peak flow versus um, the drainage system hasn't been designed to not impact uh, streets, adjacent properties, and downstream properties and local soils and vegetation. So, Angela, do you feel that you have adequate direction from the board? Um, I, I heard from Nick that you just want to meet pre-development flow rates. That and that's to be all I'm going to be reviewing. Consensus. That, it's that. not my consensus, so, so I'll, I'll be, I will be a descending vote. Okay. Okay. Any other discussion? So the second in motion. All in favor? Right. Approved with one in opposition. Opposed, yep. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. As previously noted, items 9 and 10 were tabled due to time constraints. Item number 11, staff report. Uh, yep, just <clears throat> real quickly. Um, I sent an email earlier, which some of you have already kindly responded to, and some may not have seen yet. So, um, But at last week, we had our first sort of uh, workshop hearing on the Scarborough Downs master plan, and we sort of held that outside the board's regular meeting. Board members seem to indicate that you want to continue along that pathway. Um, so at this point, after uh, discussing with the applicants team and the chair, we're looking uh, at for, to potentially have a second workshop um, on the uh, master plan on April 5th, uh, which will be a Thursday. Um, same week as our regular meeting. Um, but So if you get an opportunity to check your emails and respond, let me know your availability. That would be great. Um, that is and all I'll, I have to report at this I'll point. I'll just very quickly okay. add that, you know, part of the, part of the thinking there is that it did seem beneficial to kind of break that out. And one of the other options on the table for the next workshop would have been maybe like the same day or the same evening as the planning board meeting, which sort of did, makes it didn't seem like it would give us the same space. So, uh, yeah, just take note of that. Uh, any administrative amendments? I do not have any administrative amendments. Okay. Any planning board correspondence beyond the ones, the, the uh, correspondence that was referenced earlier? <coughs> Okay. Any planning board comments? No? Okay. Thanks for hanging out, hanging with us here. Move to adjourn. Second. That was to you? That was to you? That was to you? The board. Are we, can we keep it? What are we doing?